uh, we didn't finish up, but we've gotten all the way through uh, regression screening. Okay, now this is going to be talking with Angela and thinking about how to restructure a class. I've sort of tweaked things around. This is a you move one thing and then a bunch of other things get moved around and to sort of add things in and then figure out space for other stuff. Uh, I think maybe what I'm going to do next semester is take the general multivariate screening lecture stuff out. Um, it's good. It's good information for just sort of uh, assessing multivariate normality and a set of variables. Uh, but as we start to go into specific uh, analyses, the screening will start to sort of differ slightly for analyses specific screenings. And so uh, while the general multivariate screen is good in terms of adaptive and giving you exposure to stuff, it doesn't really map as well onto some of the specific stuff. So uh, know that the things that you did for that multivariate screen are good and the principal will do, be doing the same thing here, but uh, your uh, screening for these regression problems will follow a set of uh, uh, regression specific steps that in some ways will be a little bit more efficient than what you have to do for the multivariate screening stuff. Okay, so what we're going to do, uh, as we have before since the beginning of the last semester, uh, checking accuracy, plausibility, looking for missing values, uh, then when we look at our univariate distributions. Um, I gave you a, so one of the sheets is a review I actually wrote for a submission to a review journal and the authors were saying, why is everybody screening their regressions because there's not uh, distributional assumptions uh, for your independent variables for regression. So they went through a whole, they put a lot of work, they probably should have looked into this a little bit more before they put the time and effort in this. Uh, but so the issue is, as we talked about last time, yes, technically, uh, from a mathematical standpoint, from a classic regression standpoint, we don't have uh, assumptions about the distribution of our predictors. Uh, but what makes this important? almost always in terms of our uh, uh, applied regression analyses that makes us now have to worry about the distribution of our, of our predictors. What do we violate? Scarcity. What's that? Scarcity. Not, 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 not quite fixed effects, okay? Remember, uh, that in a classic regression, a regression conducted is regression which is designed to be uh, conducted uh, is in the context within some, some experimental stuff, right? Or uh, the assumption that uh, our predictors are hand selected for certain values that in our model we have all uh, viable uh, values for all of our predictors that were sampled systematically. It's not a random sample. We're not just sort of letting people come in, whoever comes in comes in. We're actually going out and specifically choosing. So I have uh, eight people who have values of 10 on my predictor, and uh, or 10 people who have a value of 20, 10 people who have 19, 10 people who have 18, 10 people who have 17. It's a systematic unit, so we've got it. It's assuming, uh, assuming a fixed effects model. But this is not how we do analysis. We go through and we sample people, right? And now all of a sudden we don't have a fixed effects model, we have a random uh, effects model. And all of a sudden that shakes everything up. But fortunately, we continue to, uh, our, our estimates continue to be unbiased as long as our predictors uh, or our, uh, our variables are multivariate normal. And so classic regression, we don't have to worry about uh, distributional assumptions. But because we have our original sin of always violating that fixed effects assumption, now all of a sudden we're working with random effects model and now we have to go through and make sure that we're, um, uh, that our data are multivariate normal. And so this is where our univariate uh, uh, distributions start to come in, okay? So we're gonna look at our univariate distributions, we're gonna look like our univariate outliers, and we've done this before. Looking at our bivariate relations, what we're looking at here, a couple of different things. Again, we're trying to assess the extent to which our uh, variables are bivariate normal, right? Or excuse, multivariate normal. And so one of the things we're gonna look at here, make sure that we have linear relations between all our bivariate uh, associations. Uh, we're also going to be looking for uh, uh, possible specifications of, in error here. Um, what we don't want to see is that any sort of pairwise or bivariate association has weird non-normalities or things along those lines, right? So we're going to look at our linearity of our bivariate relations, then we're going to jump in and we're going to look at our, uh, our residual distributions, right? 
uh, we're wanting to see that our uh, uh, that our errors are normally distributed and homoscedastic, right? Uh, so that we have normal distribution of our errors and so that the variance is constant across uh, all of the range of our uh, predicted values. Uh, and then we're also going to be looking for evidence of nonlinearity. This would indicate a misspecification of the model somewhere. Even if these are all linear, maybe somewhere in there some combination is producing some nonlinearity within my residuals. Want to go through take a look at that. Okay. Once we get that, then we're going to look at discrepancies, leverages, and influences. These are looking for weird cases that might throw the results of our aggression off. And then we're going to finish up with multicollinearity. Right. So we're going to step through each one of these uh, in your handout. So make sure you got your handout here. Uh, uh, your standard multiple regression screening. That is what we're going to be using. Uh, also note that on the back here, I've got. If this were, uh, if I were you, and I was writing up this assignment, this is what my screen would look like for this. Again, trying to give you guys uh, another example for sort of what this might look like, how you might lay this out, uh, and kind of the scope that I'm looking for. Right? This is what I'm looking for. No more, no less. Uh, you don't have to write uh, pages and pages and pages, uh, but also uh, sort of hopefully you've gotten uh, information that you should have or been thinking about. Uh, this is going to be a nice exercise when we go through. See. Screenings are hard unless you've done a lot of them. The more you do, the easier they get because you get to start to become more familiar with it. But you also start to take notice of things that are weird uh, or things that are maybe not perfect but not something that you would necessarily be concerned about. Okay. Questions before we jump into stuff? All right. So let's go through and open up uh, our regression set. So what we've got uh, is we're, uh, the model that we're going to run, uh, highlighted down here uh, at the bottom, we're going to regress role functioning, or we want to regress role functioning is our uh, indicator of adaptive functioning in day-to-day -day life. So we're saying, oh, this is a 0, 100 variable, cool. We're going to regress this onto uh, PTSD symptom severity, uh, pain severity, and opiate use, uh, yes, no. So we've got two continuous predictors, one dichotomous predictor, uh, and then we've got uh, what we've uh, conceptualizing is a continuous outcome here. Okay, So this is going to be different than our general multivariate screening because we've got a specific model that we're going to want to go through and, and test. Okay, um, So first thing we're going to do is I'm going to go... As I'm doing this, I strongly encourage you all to be saving uh, commands into a syntax file. Because again, the syntax file for one regression is going to be probably pretty similar to the steps in your syntax for another. This is just a nice way to go through and speed things up as you're going through and doing stuff. So first thing I want to do, if I'm concerned about accuracy, plausibility, uh, first thing I might want to do is start to go through, and I'm going to let, uh, request my frequencies. Okay. And I've got a dichotomous uh, indicator there. Uh, for my dichotomous indicator, what am I going to be looking at in terms of my in requesting these frequencies here? What do you think, Kate? What am I interested in? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? What's that? What did you ask? Sorry. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to take a look at the frequencies of my opiate variable. What am I What am I uh, interested in looking at here? Uh, to make sure like the ratio is all right. Okay, yeah, I want to take it. So yeah, going to be looking at frequencies, and then going to be looking at uh, at cell sizes, or excuse me, uh, uh, 
total sample size. So seeing in terms of uh, in terms of these data what am I what am, what am I uh, seeing here exactly right so if I go through and I take a quick look at how many people I should have uh, I go down through I see I've got 201 cases in the set um, and I've got 201 people here and pretty almost almost equal distribution here. Uh, we've got 101 uh, individuals who aren't taking opiates, 100 individuals who are. So this is nice. We like this. We've got a nice, easy balance going on here. Remember, this is what we're going to be looking at for. We can have, for our economist uh, indicator, we can have outliers for our categorical variables if we've got uh, categories that have that nine to one ratio, right? Sort of huge, huge unbalanced stuff. We can tolerate quite a bit of unbalance. We might want to note it. It makes our uh, analyses less robust, but if it starts to get too extreme, it's functionally uh, a univariate outlier within the context of a categorical variable, and we want to flag that and probably not use that variable, try and sort of recode it or something. Okay, so we're looking good there. So we're gonna go to analyze descriptives. And let's go through and take a look at uh, pain severity, PTSD, and role function. Go to options, request skew and kurtosis values. Uh, and then I'm going to hit save standardized variables as sort of give me the scores for each of these. Okay. Go through Here's that. Go through and run this. Haley, what am I seeing here? Um, all scores are within the acceptable ranges. Okay. But it looks like role functioning has some pretty strong positive pertosis and some positive skew. Yeah, right. So two on, so it looks like I don't have any missing data. So that's good. I don't have to worry about that, right? Um, and it looks like for my uh, uh, pain severity and my PTSD severity, both of those are looking good, at least in terms of uh, sort of are my values within sort of the bounds of what I would expect right now. Again, uh, wanting people to be careful in terms of how they're talking about this, right? Uh, at this point, we wouldn't want to say necessarily, although we might well, take, go through take a look, want to say things approximate normality unless they are pretty normal. Uh, just because our uh, skew and kurtosis values are less than two doesn't mean that things are approximately normal. And you'll see that as soon as you graph things out, right? I have a skew of 1.5. And it's graphically, there's quite a bit of skew going on on there, right? So just want to be careful that you're being precise in how you're talking about this. But uh, here, things are looking pretty good, except for role functioning. This looks funky, right? And so I should be thinking about, well, this is my outcome variable. Need to do some further exploration on, on sort of what we might have going on in terms of this. So uh, easy way to get all that business, go to descriptives. Right. Go down to explore. Let's load up uh, pain severity, PTSD, and role functioning. Uh, and then here, remember, do this. Otherwise, uh, your cases are going to be little li listed or labeled by sort of their position in the set, not by your subject number. So take subject number, drop that down to the label cases by, and then you plot your request your histograms here. Go ahead and paste that. Run that file or that right there. Um, and so, just so you know, there, there's redundancies, right? If you didn't want to deal with sort of that initial uh, descriptives command, I like it because it just kind of lays it out everything where you can see it real easy. You can just jump straight in and do explore. Explore is going to give you skew kurtosis values of everything. So, modify as you see fit as long as you're getting uh, the the right. So, like here, we can see skew, see skew kurtosis for pain severity, skew kurtosis, and a bunch of other uh, descriptive statistics for pain uh, or PTSD. Same thing here, right? So, 
This is personal preference, uh, but just want you to know that I'm aware that there's some redundancies. Um, this is how I like to do it, but you do you. Um, all right. So pain severity, John. What am I? What am I seeing in terms of uh, my histogram for pain severity here? SPSS has put together this histogram. It's created some gaps in the distribution. That looks probably more like a function of scaling than anything else. Um, you know, this is the one thing that's that's tricky about uh, interpreting histograms is that the histogram you get from one program might be different than the histogram you get from another, depending on what I said is in terms of my bending and the widths of my intervals and things like that. It's going to start to change this around. So this is why. Um, you know, when I'm having you both look at histograms and box plots, this is why I use because you could get you could get the wrong interpretation about your data uh, given a certain type of bending with a histogram. Uh, and if I were to go through and start changing that around, it's going to change uh, the look of it. It's hard to go through and change. It's a pain to go through and change it in SPSS. SPSS just generally does a reasonable job. Later, when you're working in state of that width uh, command in there, you can start playing around with that to get something that looks reasonable here. But uh, again, um, from our histogram, some slight negative skew, which we knew from the indices, right? Uh, but overall, not looking too bad, certainly acceptable um, for our uh, box and whisker plot. It uh, looks like we have one, two, three, four, five, maybe five cases. Although be careful because SPSS will mask these, right? If you've got multiple points that are all the same value, it'll label one but not a couple other ones behind them. So just be careful that you're not missing things. I'm starting to evolve in sort of how I'm thinking about this. If you've got two or three cases down here, go ahead and tell me what numbers are falling below one and a half times the inner quartile, uh, one and a half times the inner quartile range. If you've got a whole bunch of them, you don't have to count them up or tell me so if you got seven or eight you don't have to list them all out just say a number of cases falling below this right we want to be because again as we're going through these screenings uh again this isn't just for me to have you write down numbers just for the uh, purpose of writing down numbers but what ends up happening when we're screening data if we've got cases that are problematic it's the same case that keeps popping up and, and case after case after case and if you're keeping track of of who's falling where you can say hey I'm seeing 202 keep popping up in a number of different places. Kind of helps you make some sense of things in the end. So uh, we have some uh, his, uh, box plot suggesting some negative skew, uh, some values popping up here at the end. If I'm looking up my histogram, I'm assuming it's these folks up here. Uh, so I want to make a note of that. Uh, my PTSD, that's gorgeous. That's beautiful. I really like that a whole lot. Right. Uh, this is hopefully what you would get with a normal uh, variable that has a normal distribution and a reasonably large sample. We've got about 200 people here, right? So this is looking good. I mean, I would identify this as this is uh, approx. I would say that this is approximating normality. The distribution approximating normality. Uh, uh, sort of nothing too much. I mean, I would say this is unremarkable, but it's not given how nice this is in terms of the split. So just say, uh, so looking normal here, we've got one guy, case 221, I'm guessing it right here in the box plot. But that box plot is also nice and symmetrical. We've got one value falling beyond what uh, SPSS calls one and a half times the inner quartile range, which is not, but so we got one high case. So we've got someone who's uh, scoring high in terms of uh, their PTSD severity, but that's something pretty good, okay? So I'm happy about things that we've got done. But here's my role function of the variable, okay? And that's my box plot for my role function of the variable. What's, what's going on with this histogram? Or what's going on with role function in here? It's severely positively skewed. Okay, I mean, I, I would say it's, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's skewed, uh, it certainly, I mean, I, I might be careful about severely positive skewed. I, I mean, my skew value is 1.4. Uh, 
right? And so in the grand scheme of how things could be skewed, this isn't skewed like our, uh, remember our months, visible, sort of visible, clear, positive skew. Well, what's the bigger issue? Yeah. The world functions being measured as discrete. Yeah, this is, a, it's very clear, right? So I've got sort of a zero to, uh, zero to 100 uh, scale on this, right? So I think, oh, zero to 100, right? There's 100 different values this could take on. Does it take on 100 different values? No, nope. it takes on five. And if we go back through and we take a look at how we've measured this, right? We find out that the uh, role functioning is measured on this scale, takes values of zero, 25, 50, 75, and 100, okay? And so if we're looking at this and we're thinking about who we've sampled, so these are uh, motor vehicle accident survivors who uh, are coming in to our clinic uh, at Buffalo to go through and say, hey, I need some treatment, I need some help because I got in this bad crash and now I'm having terrible sort of traumatic anxiety and stuff like that. And so this is, but if this is, we understand that that's who we're sampling. And this is our role function. What's, what's happening, what's happening here in these data? Very high floor effect. What's up? Very high floor effect. Very high floor effect, yeah, and absolutely, Emilio. And what does that mean within the context of what we're measuring here? Uh, people are coming in with very low uh, role function scores. Yeah. Sure. Extreme, right? So people are flooring out, right? Which makes some sense, right? We've got people coming in uh, with sort of a lot of musculoskeletal pain, um, a lot of psychological difficulties. If I'm asking people overall how well they're doing, most people are scoring zero, right? Like very, very low levels of functioning, right? Uh, we have some people who are scoring higher up the up the distribution, right? But uh, basically, we've got a measurement problem, right? This functioning uh, uh, measure that we've collected is suboptimal in a lot of ways. One, is not super sensitive and it's putting everybody at the bottom of the scale. And then two, it's not a continuous measure, it's an ordinal measure. Uh, it's basically a categorical measure putting people in zero, 25, 50, 75, and 100, okay? This is not a problem you want to discover at this stage of the game, right? This is why it starts to become important that you know uh, sort of what what your measures are, how they're measuring things, what the scanning looks like on that type of stuff. Right now, we didn't run that entire project just for this scale. This is something to look at an outcome measure, so we might not care so much about this. But if this was your, this was your thesis or your dissertation or something like that, you wouldn't say, "Oh, I'm going to run a linear regression." Then all of a sudden, you get that, and you're like, "Ah, crap! I didn't look at how this scale is scored and how things go, think, go through and put together." Okay, so we've got, yeah, we've got noticeable skew. Right, uh, uh, sort of, a, and I would say this is problematic levels of, of skew. Uh, uh, the big thing is here is that we have an ordered categorical variable in terms of our outcome, and it starts to become problematic in thinking about uh, sort of is regression a good strategy for these data given the level of measurement of my outcome. Questions about sort of this type of thing. And so this starts to become important, I think, as you're going through and screening data is, is thinking about some of these things because if I'm not being thoughtful, I would just say, oh, role function is skewed, and so we need to do something about it. But this stage of the game, there's not, we've measured it how we measure it. There's not a ton that we can do. We'll, we'll go through and try and make it better, but it's not great, uh, just based in terms of uh, what we'd hope for in terms of that. And we'll see that this starts to keep coming up again and again and again. This may be something that you would have seen uh, in this last set as you're going through, uh, okay, I've got a DAS score that's weird, and so how do I, do I go through and smooth it? Well, if I do that, then the same variable keeps coming up again and again. It's problematic. We start to see within these multivariate analyses radiating effects of stuff, right? So you want to catch things early and then go through and make adjustments and try and this is often what we're left with is trying to make the best with kind of a poor situation all around um, and trying to come through and come up with a strategy that's going to minimize my headache down the road. Okay. So again, we take a look at uh, my uh, box plot. Haley, what's, how do I understand this? What's, what's going on with my box plot here? Um, I mean, similar to histogram, they're kind of bin together. So the outliers are essentially just a different Scores. Mm -hmm. We can't interpret it because it's not the right type of 
route. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't interpret it if I look at it. Look, what does is, what is, what is this line down here at the bottom tell me? That's just the floor effect again. So yeah. most of the scores are at the bottom. It's telling me that my uh, that my first quartile, my uh, median, and my third quartile are all the same value. It's all zero, right? Uh, and then anything that, uh, any score that's not zero falls beyond uh, three times the interquartile range because the interquartile range is zero because there it's all the same score, right? And so uh, when you're going through, if you were to see something like that, I just want you to talk about that so that you know, so that these components, so this is just saying that uh, first, uh, first, second, and third quartile, or first, uh, the median, the first and uh, third quartile are all values of zero and then everything above that is, that's why it's all looking funky and gross. So questions about sort of what we've got up to here. All right, so now we're kind of at a choice point. We could go through and we could start looking at uh, univariate outliers, but does it make sense to look at univariate outliers right now? What do you think, John? Yeah, right, I mean I could. This is a real function is just going to come up and tell me that everything that's not zero is an outlier. Okay. But I can anticipate that, so we don't need to go through and run a bunch of stuff and then have to go backwards and things along those lines. At this point, I'm saying I got to do something with this variable before I move forward. Otherwise, I'm just going to have to say, yep, there's problems with this variable when I already know that there's problems with this variable. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and say, well, let me take a look and see if I can log transform this. Uh, log transforms are nice, as we talked about before, is it retains some interpretive value, right? And so what I'm going to do, and again, it would be easier to go through and just type this into the command prompt, but uh, we'll go through, uh, if we go through transform, go to Q variable, I'm going to say I'm going to run a, create a variable, or what did I, Call it roll len natural log, right? Um, and then if I go down uh, and I take a look and I hit arithmetic, I see the natural log function, right? So I'm saying uh, the natural log of roll functioning is going to be equal to ln, and then I can go through and say roll there, okay? What is this going to do if I try and uh, run the natural log of roll functioning? Yeah, which why is it not going to work, Kate? Because I got zeros, and I can't take the, the natural log, or the log of zeros is, is undefined. I can't do that, right? Does that mean I can't use a natural log function? Nope. What do I do, Kate? Use You're on a roll. Constant. What's up? Use a constant. You just add a constant onto that, right? So if my low value is zero, I can't take the natural log of zero, but I can take the natural log of one, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, my new variable is the natural log of my role functioning variable plus one, okay? Because we don't, at this point, we're switching around the scale. It doesn't matter sort of what the numbers are, right? We, we're already executing a transform. So uh, adding a constant onto this doesn't do anything for us. One is nice. Uh, it could be anything you want, 33.6, 100, whatever you want, right? It's just got to get that uh, value off of zero. Uh, the constant isn't going to change the shape of the distribution at all. Um, so just adding a constant on one is a good a number as any for doing this, okay? And so if we go through and paste this down, you'll see, as you start to become uh, familiar with SPSS syntax, you'll recognize that this value goes through compute variables. It starts to become easier to just go through and type it in uh, than going through uh, the pull down menu. But if we go through and let's say, uh, I'm gonna go pull the big money move here. So I know I'm gonna have to go through and take a look at uh, this variable. And I'm also going to want to take a look at the graph. So I'm just going to copy down my examine and drop roll functioning in there. And then I'm going to want to go through and look at Z scores. So I'm going to take that, paste that down here. Right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute uh, my roll functioning variable. Then I'm going to request uh, uh, my graphs for that. And then I want to go through and take a look at uh, z scores. And so 
I'm going to get skewing ketosis from my explorer, so I can go ahead and get rid of that if I wanted to, right? Um, so just going through, uh, and don't be afraid to go through, play around with, with uh, this syntax. It starts to become nice to be able to go through and just sort of change stuff instead of taking all the time to run through uh, the pull down files to do stuff, okay? So, we'll go through, and it looks like it calculated, didn't give me an error. Here's role functioning, okay? So I've created my log transform variable. Now I'm just gonna run my examine command and hit that. So I can go down through and take a look at my skew and kurtosis here. What did, uh, what did the, oops. What did this do to my uh, skew and kurtosis values? So before skew and kurtosis, my skew was 2.26, my kurtosis was 4.2. Now I'm going down through my skew, 1.5, so it's still not great, but it's better. My kurtosis was, what was it, four something? Is that right? Kurtosis was 4.2, now it's 0.24. That's good, right? So at least in terms of my statistical indices, this is an improvement relative to what we had before, right? But if I go down through and I take a look at my uh, <laughs> at, at my histogram, is that do I like that? No, it's still bad, right? It's better than it was, but it's still not great. Uh, I mean, how many values does my uh, the natural log? Uh, transform of my uh, role function variable take on. The same. Still, it still just takes on, but it's not creating sort of variability or sort of creating new scores. I mean, I took the log transform of five different scores. It's just going to give me five new scores. So it didn't change the level of measurement at all. Uh, my box plot is still basically the same thing. Uh, a zero is still my uh, first, uh, second, and third quartile is all zero. Everything else is still up here. It's not as far up as before, and it's not as spread out as it was. So we've made some improvements, but it's still not great. Okay. So we have a couple of different options here, right? Uh, if we throw up our hands and say, well, shenanigans on that, I guess we're not running this analysis. You probably don't want to do that, right? Um, probably the correct way to do this is to think about uh, not using linear regression, right? Probably the different ordinal regression models uh, that take into account count variables as outcomes, right? Or sort of order categorical uh, stuff. Uh, so an ordinal regression model is probably going to be the best way to run this. Now we're not going to worry about ordinal regression models, those are more complicated, but that's probably something that if this was your project you would probably need to look at and think about, okay, this is probably the, the model that's most appropriate. Okay. What else could we do with this? If, let's go back through and take a look at the original. What else could I do with that outcome? Yeah, I mean, you could dichotomize it. You could say basically everybody has zero functioning, and then we have people who are not zero functioning. I mean, you could think about if for some reason either you didn't have the capability or the expertise, uh, or you just didn't want to look into how to run an ordinal regression. Um, I mean, you could do it, SPSS will do it for you, right? You could go through and just say, I'm going to go through and dichotomize this outcome and then just run a logistic on this, right? Now, uh, the drawback to that is you're saying that everybody who isn't zero is the same functionally, and so you lose some stuff, right? So dichotomizing could be an option. It's probably not the best option in this, but it's definitely something that you that you could do, right? Or what we can do and what we're going to do today is we're just going to say, well, we're going to log transform. We're going to call it close enough and just move forward with this. Okay, this is going to cause some problems with some other stuff, and you're going to turn into the, it's going to make our residual plots look real weird. 
uh, and we'll take a look and see kind of what this does. The regression is pretty robust. I mean, if you're going to write this up for publication, right, and you were going to present it to somebody, you probably just need to apply the right analysis and look at normal regression model. But uh, given that that's not where we're at, we'll just pretend that this is sort of doing what we want to and, and move forward with the regression or with the with the transformed variable as our outcome. Questions about this? Okay, but so I want you to recognize that sort of these would start to become decision points, right? Uh, and there's not one right answer. I mean, there's probably a best answer for this, right? You just, okay, you just run the model that's developed to address the type of variables that you assess. But there are sometimes situations that keep you from doing that type of stuff. So uh, in applied analysis, our, our, our chore is to do make the make the most of what we've got with the resources that we have and just try and choose something that's oftentimes the least bad option in here and if we're stuck for some reason running a regression model because we have to do it then probably going through and saying well this is at least better than what we had before not great but good enough I mean other thing too I mean we've got 200 people in the sample it's pretty decent size. It's, I don't feel great about it, but I guess I can carry on with that, that uh, sort of moving forward with this. Okay. Questions on sort of choice points here? Okay. So uh, going through, taking a look at that, and so now let's go through and take a look and run, here I run the descriptors of my z-scores, right? So I see mean standard deviations, and then what I'm going to do Take my descriptives. Actually, no, that's a good name. I'll just go analyze the descriptives, kick these guys out, and then take my z score pain, z score PTSD, and then the z score of my role functioning. I don't need to save my z scores on my z scores, and I don't need skew and kurtosis values. Okay. And my Z scores. All right, Layla, what am I looking for here? Um, looking for, uh, or sorry, univariate outliers. Okay. Do I have concerns about univariate outliers in my set of data here? Yeah, what would you say? Yeah, what are, you, what are you saying in terms of pain score? Okay, yeah. So we're seeing a low minimum. What about my PTSD? So it looks like, based on uh, uh, looking at my standardized scores, I've got, and this is Sort of nice work. We often sort of get blind to the negative Z scores, but that just means you got sort of low things happening in the low area. Uh, so make sure you're looking at low. So it looks like we have uh, our lowest uh, pain scores, just a skosh over three standard deviations below the mean. Uh, our high PTSD score, just a touch above three standard deviations above the mean. And then our transformed uh, uh, role functioning variables actually not too bad, right? Uh, so at least in terms of cleaning up some of this stuff, that was at least kind of successful. So we're happy there. Now, what's, so we do have uh, things that are probably pretty high values, right? Uh, but when I said, is there any concern, Kate, you were kind of shaking your head. What, what's making you less concerned about uh, low levels of pain, high levels of PTSD here? I was just asking you what the, um, cut off was, but since they're both below that. Okay, so technically, if I want to say three two nine is sort of a yeah. would be something that was P less than sort of point sort of zero zero or equal to point zero zero one, right? Um, so yeah, so we're not sort of hitting that, right? Now three is 
decent size, right? What's, what's sort of the bigger thing? Do you know? Uh, they all fold on a table scale once the max. So we've got high and we've got low scores, but these are looking like they're kind of relatively sort of continuous parts of the distribution. Now the histogram for pain was kind of all chopped up, right? But what I don't have is something that looks like this and then some guy hanging out there, right? So that, that helps, right? What's, what's the other thing? So that's, that's a good point, probably something you would want to talk about if you're sort of providing a justification for whether or not you want to continue on and take a look at stuff. What's the other thing that we've got going for us here? What's that? It's the, the box one. They all they don't fall the three times the like Okay, know. yeah. So it's so a box plot is still relatively close to their face. Yeah. So our, so our graphical our okay. graphical uh, uh, analysis is saying that things are sort of not no one's no one's way out of bounds, yeah. What's the other thing? And given the population of interest for PTSD total score in particular, it's expected that yeah. They would have it. I would expect some I would expect some sort of high scores, right? So I'm not super concerned, so it makes some sense. And I would actually hope I get some high scores in this in this thing, right? What's what's the what's the one other thing that makes me less concerned about sort of this, or make make my analysis robust my to size. my sample size. Okay? This is the thing. If I have a large sample, I'm expecting some of those some of those. The bigger thing about this, remember that our concern with our uh, with uh, our samples, is our samples are always, and this is why we have to adjust our assessment of variance, because our samples are always, our samples are primarily gonna choose from out of here, right? Uh, unless we've got really big samples, we're probably not gonna get, we're less likely to get those big uh, uh, high and those big low scores, right? But if I've got a sample of about 200 people, is one score that's three standard deviations above the mean gonna have that much of an impact on sort of overall stuff? Now, if I've got, uh, say, a sample of 40, right, and I'm trying to run a regression, and I've got a distribution that looks here, and I've got some things out here, and these folks are 3.5 to 5 standard deviations above the mean, then, that's, then I start to get worried about that, right? Um, but this starts to become uh, important where I uh, want you all to be thinking, so let's say one of these uh, uh, scores uh, for like PTSD was Say it's three and a half, say it's three five, right? Does that be something we would want to smooth or get rid of? Still probably not. I would definitely note it in the screener. I'd be like, hey, I've got someone who's really high. And if it's that high, I might want to go through, want to make sure and check that that score had been entered correctly, right? Um, and so I might note it. But again, even if that's a real score, uh, I'm probably not going to be too worried about. Again, large samples address a lot of stuff, right? It makes us robust, and so that is nice because, again, uh, if I'm looking at uh, car accident survivors and sort of functioning and things like that, I just don't want to throw out all the people who are most severe. Those are probably the people who I'm uh, interested in, right? And I don't want to fuss around with their scores a whole lot. Um, so wanting to go through, this is where uh, sort of taking information about my sample, about what I should be seeing, um, uh, taking information about uh, overall sort of distribution graphically, uh, is this something that I would follow up? So here, given a large sample, it looks like we've got scores that are right, just a little bit above three standard deviations of the mean, I probably wouldn't even worry about this too much uh, moving forward with things. If I had something like three, three or something like that, I might sort of flag them and say, hey, this is someone who's high or low, or things along those lines, but probably not something I'm gonna worry about too much. Questions? All right, so going through accuracy, plausibility, uh, going through our uh, univariate distributions, make some corrections or role functioning, looking at our, uh, uh, our um, univariate outliers. So the next thing we're going to do for our screening is we want to go through and take a look at uh, uh, our linearity uh, of our library relations. Now we've got a pretty simple model here, and so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to my scatter dot plot, and take my matrix, drop it up here, and then I'm just going to go through and take uh, my pain severity score, my PTSD total, 
in my role function and drop it down there. Okay. Now, could we put opiate use in there? We could. Can I test, uh, relate, can I test the, the relation of opiate use with my consumer's variables for non-normalities? No, yeah, I can't. You know, you're right. I mean, do you know why? Can I have a nonlinear relation with the dichromous variable? Essentially, it's going to be that, right? Can I have a nonlinear relation there? No. I mean, there's not. There's there's no there's no way to draw one. Right? So it's going to be linear no matter what. But one of the things is now these uh, scatter plots or these scatter matrices start to get pretty busy, right? And so I, the fewer variables I can have in there, so the easier it makes it to see things. So uh, sometimes I won't drop those uh, dichotomous indicators in there. But the one thing, uh, what's one thing that might you could glean from a plot like this? Not linearity. Like the balance design. A, a type of balance, right? So you might, but you, I should have been able to go through and look at that. So I saw that before in my frequencies. Yeah, right. Almost get elasticity, but really what we're talking about here, if we've got a dichotomous variable, is it's a homogeneity of variance issue, right? I mean, if I plot that, then I've got my scores for no opiate use, and say this is PTSD. Opioid, no, yes, right? This can be a nice way to identify uh, homogeneity of variance issues, right? Which, within the context of regression, we call this uh, 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 homoscedasticity uh, or heteroscedasticity. I can identify that easily, right? And say, I've got a heteroscedastic relationship, so we've got very little variability here, a lot of variability here. Um, and so I didn't do this, I didn't include. Uh, opiate use in your screening thing, um, but that's not to say that you couldn't include that in there. Uh, again, you're not looking at uh, using this to test linearity because it's always going to be linear, uh, but what you can start to do is see very clearly differences in the variability uh, at one level of the group versus your other level of the group. It's a nice way to visualize that, right? We would still call it heteroscedasticity, right? We've got uh, less variability at the zero as we go through, so if we see a so this is my regression line, right? I've got more variability at the high end and the low end, so we're still talking about it as, uh, as heteroscedasticity, but we, it's essentially we're looking at homogeneity variance across these two things, okay? Does it make some sense? Okay, cool. Um, but for right now, let's just take a look at our continuous variables. Um, go through and paste this. And then, just because I like to do it because it gives me a, a, a kind of a better view, I'm going to double click this. I'm going to say 460, is that what we do? Just sort of tweaking around, so it just give me. I don't know. I, I get very particular about sort of what my stuff looks like, so I fool around with that stuff. If you don't need to do that, then fine. It just gives me kind of a better sense of what's going on here. So um, if we go through and we take a look, John, what am I what am I seeing in this in this graph? Please, uh, remind me again what we're looking for with with this scatter plot matrix. Uh, so Okay, now when 
is, is there, I, think, I think you're on the right track. So you're saying uh, we're not seeing, at least from these scatter plots, any clear evidence of nonlinearity. Now, the one thing I will say is it starts to become tricky, and this is where uh, some of the sort of fitting a, a nice, uh, fitting a lowest line can be helpful, particularly if we've got sort of clusters of stuff that can start to sort of indicate nonlinearities. But based on sort of this, it's not looking too bad. Okay. Now you said there's no evidence of uh, uh, heteroscedasticity, and I might temper that a little bit. Why? I agree with you. I don't think there's, I don't think we have a problem with heteroscedasticity. But can we say there's no, uh, that we have no evidence of heteroscedasticity? Which of these plots uh, is looking like that's sort of trending that way at least? What do you think, Haley? Um, role functioning and PTSD. Yeah. If I'm looking at this, right, I'm saying so that at zero, we've got a lot of variability in PTSD severity at zero, right? So I've got it's saying I've got a lot of people with uh, so PTSD scores widely variable at zero role functioning, which makes some sense, right? I can not be functioning for a lot of different reasons that may or may not be related to PTSD. As my role functioning increases, variability around my PTSD scores decrease, right? Now, is this a three to one difference here? No. So I'm probably not gonna get too worked up about it, but this is where I want you guys to be careful and not say things like there's no evidence of heteroscedasticity because I was like, well, it's not problematic. I'm not gonna get, uh, have a heart attack over the situation, but it looks like sort of I do get decreasing variability. And if I start to think about sort of what these variables mean, this starts to make some sense to me, right? Um, so just being careful about how you're, how you're talking about this. Now looking at this, again, it's not sort of uh, problematic levels of heteroscedasticity, but also what's the other thing that's going on uh, with, with this uh, association, and maybe this one to a lesser degree. What variables included in these sort of these two uh, these two uh, plots that I've identified as having possible heteroscedasticity? Role functioning. Role functioning, right? It's the same variable that I thought was problematic shouldn't be in a regression model to begin with, right? Because it's skewed, and so again, this is a lot of times when you've got variables that don't have a nice distribution this is where you're gonna see other things start to pop up in terms of, well, if I had to guess which relations were, or which associations were gonna demonstrate problems with, potential problems with sort of non-constant variance, well, they'd probably be the ones that are kind of skewed anyway. So I'm not, this is all sort of fitting together in the same picture, and, and so I'm saying, well, okay, I'm sort of noticing that. Yeah. Um, in these screenings, we would have to do the uh, transform variable, right? What's, what's that? We would have to do the transform variable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, did I not the transfer? Oh, okay. Thank you. Looks yeah. almost yeah. the same though. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just it's more the right. This. So it's 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 uh, it's not as bad, right? Um, but it's still not great with this stuff, right? So again, uh, not only recognizing uh, so hey this looks kind of screwy, but also wanting to think about what's causing what's causing this to go through and and, and uh, be problematic. And this is one of the nice things in SPSS because uh, it goes through and you can get the histogram and the diagonal that kind of remind you of what the uh, the univariate distributions of, of these start to look like. 
but let's say that I maybe did have a concern about the relation between pain and PTSD total, right? If I go to graphs, go to chart builder, and I want to look at a scatter plot of, say, PTSD here and pain here, right? Hit OK. And then what I can do uh, here, if I double click on this, Elements and I go to fit line and total, and I uh, ask it to tell it to fit a lowest right there. Right? What that's going to do is it's going to fit a, 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 a kind of a, a moving fit line right there, uh, which would be a nice way to go through to identify a potential problem. So I can hit apply, right? And then if I go back, I go to and then close this out, and I go back to elements and I go back to fit line and total and I request linear and I tell it to not to attach that label line and hit apply there close so what this will do is it'll give me and so we'll talk about this a little bit more in our scatter plots right so this is my line lip line of linear best fit between these two variables this lowest is sort of kind of sort of weaving away into getting a weighted pie sort of different variables, right? Uh, so it doesn't look terribly bad. But I could have something like this where it was a pretty dense plot, where actually this lowest fit was showing a pretty clear curvilinear thing. Uh, and then I might want to go through and say, oh, I'm not seeing sort of the data as a whole sort of sort of show of nonlinearity, but there's stuff going on in there which suggests some nonlinear relation. So uh, if you have anything that starts to look a little bit funky, this is one way you can go through and kind of take a look. Uh, this Lois is a nice way to go through and see, based on the sample data, what is this, sort of what would be the curve that would best sort of fit all of this stuff. Okay, Haley, you're frowning at me. What's going on? I missed a step somewhere. Okay. Um, it's weird, but we'll talk about it. Don't worry about it. We'll go through when we get to our residual plots. We'll do the same thing for that, so I'll show you where okay. I'm all right, so do we have concerns about nonlinearity in our binary relations? Doesn't look like it. Uh, any concerns uh, with uh, problematic heteroscedasticity in our binary relations? Not too bad, right? Uh, so feeling good about my bivariate relations, or at least as good as I can outside of the real function. Okay. So now what I want to do. I want to go down through and I want to take a look at my residual plots. And I'm going to ask, uh, one, I'm going to uh, request residuals for this, and I'm going to tell SPSS to save a number of different uh, variables that I'm going to use for different types of diagnostics. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to Analyze, Regression, drop down to the linear. Okay. But this time, instead of going through and regressing all of our variables onto a subject number, we're just going to run the model that we want to test anyway, right? So I'm going to go down and I'm going to take the natural log of row functioning, put that as my dependent variable, drop opiate use, opiate use is my IV, pain severity, and PTSD total. Okay? I'm just telling the SPSS how to go through and, and uh, run my regression model. If I was going to go to through and uh, run a hierarchical model, not for screening, but just because I want to run a hierarchical model. This block one of one, right? I would, if those were the three I wanted my first step, I'd just drop those in and then hit next, and then layer in the ones I would want to put in for my next step and hit next, so on and so forth. But I'm not going to worry about that now. Um, in terms of statistics, I'm going to request uh, uh, collinearity diagnostics. Uh, I'm going to request part and partial correlations. That's going to be Basically, I'm going to run my eventual model unless I change any of the variables around. So I can just go through and kind of just request them all at once. So I'm going to request part, part and partial correlations, collinearity diagnostics. This is where I would ask for confidence intervals, right? Um, Case-wise diagnostics. Now, this is going to go through, and SPSS is going to flag uh, cases that have like high residuals and things like that. Uh, outliers are going to be three standard deviations. I can change that to. Two if I wanted to. 
we're going to do other stuff, but just kind of knowing what uh, that's uh, happening there. So make sure I got park bars, correlations, culinary, and then plots. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for uh, my predicted values, my standardized predicted values. So this is my, based on my model, my predicted, uh, standardized predicted values of my outcome. I'm going to put that on my X, and I'm going to take this SD resid. This is my what SPSS calls my deleted studentized residuals. When we're going through our, our lecture slides, remember this is our studentized residual. I'm going to go through, drop that into my Y value. Okay. And so what this is going to do is it's going to give me a plot that I'm able to go through and take a look at uh, whether or not I have nonlinearities in my residuals, uh, whether or not I have heteroscedastic errors, things along those lines. This would be nice. Uh, then I'm also going to go down through and I'm going to ask for histograms and normal probability plots. And this is going to give me a histogram of my residuals uh, and that uh, PD plot that we've talked about, right, uh, give us a sense for whether or not our uh, residuals are normally distributed. There. I'm going to hit save. Lots of different things that SPSS will save for us. But the things that we're going to focus on are leverage values, my studentized deleted residuals. Okay, this is the same residuals we requested in the plot. Uh, these are your residuals that are going to be uh, 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 consistent with uh, a T distribution. Um, and then what I'm going to also ask for. Uh, our Cook's values, okay? Um, lots and lots of other stuff that you can go through and uh, request here. We talked about some more intensive diagnostics. You can request that here, but these are the three that we're gonna focus on for right now. And continue, and options, don't have to worry about that. Style, you don't have to worry about that. So I think I've got my diagnostic model put together, okay? Questions about what we've got so far. going to give me a bunch of regression output. Now, uh, right now, the regression output isn't necessarily what I want to be interested in, but if I go through and I take a look at uh, new variables, here are my studentized uh, deleted residuals here, my Cook's values, or my Cook's uh, D, uh, my leverage values. So what uh, SPSS has done is it's written those into new variables. So these are new variables in my data set that we'll go through and take a look at, okay? So, First thing I want to do though is I'm concerned about my residuals. Now this is my regression because I ran a regression model. It's going through and, and taking a look at that. We won't worry about that for right now. Um, but if I go through and take a look at my residual statistics, what I can go through and take a look at, this is a nice way to remember that uh, uh, in terms of our discrepancies, right? Remember discrepancy is the difference between uh, what my observed outcome is versus what uh, the, the model is predicting the outcome should be for that case, right? Uh, this is being assessed through our residuals. And we talked about uh, our studentized residuals as a nice means of sort of going through, and then it's a nice thing to take a look at. What was, can someone remind me with uh, those studentized residuals? How, how was that studentized residual calculated? My studentized residual. What this does is remember if we've got a situation where right, and this is my uh, regression line for those five points, but then all of a sudden I have a case. Right here, right? And I throw that in the mix. Where's my new regression line go? Through this point, right? I've got a point that's a high discrepancy, high leverage value, right? Uh, if this point is in my in my regression model, what's the this is a problematic point. We can all agree this is a problematic point, right? Because it's pulling the whole regression line down, 
right? Well, what's the residual for this model or for this point? If we're just calculating the residual is the difference between the predicted versus the actual value. My residual here is close to zero, right? This is where my studentized residuals come in. And remember, the studentized residual looks at uh, the deviation uh, between my observed point and the fitted point if that was not included in the model, right? So this is, if that case were not included in the model, this is the expected value for that case, right? And so my studentized residual is gonna be really big, right? Versus if uh, I'm just uh, looking at the residual of my regression line with this case in relative to sort of where that is, this, this uh, point actually masks it. it. It makes it for a really small residual. So I wouldn't identify that case as problematic if I'm just looking at residuals because residual is really small. Well, my studentized residual is actually gonna be pretty significant there. Right? Um, and so this is sort of the difference between, there's all sorts of different types of ways of cal calculating residuals, but this is why sort of, one, because it gives you a little bit more information with the studentized deleted residual, and then two, uh, these residuals are distributed along uh, a T distribution, so you can actually, if you wanted to, you could put P values, you could sign values and sort of determine how big or small they are relative to stuff. That's why people often will sort of recommend taking a look at, at these studentized residuals for those reasons. Now, as our sample sizes start to get increasingly large, our standardized residuals and our studentized residuals start to get pretty equal, but particularly in small samples, you can start to see differences here, okay? So, if I go down here and I take a look at, uh, in my output, uh, we'll see right here, I've got my range of studentized, uh, uh, studentized deleted residuals here, okay? Now, I've got a low bound of uh, negative 2.2, upper bound of 2.9. Am I too concerned about those residuals? What do you think, Elena? No. No, why not? Because they fall in the 2 to 4 range. What's that? Yeah, they fall between the 2 to 4 range. 2 to 4, okay. And so be careful with that, right? I, so I put that in the slide just to sort of demonstrate, like, how people, sort of depending on sort of how people are, people use benchmarks anywhere from two to four, right? That's not saying that anything between two to four is not problematic. Think about these as z-scores, right? I mean, literally, I mean, essentially talking about standard deviation units away from sort of expected uh, values of zero and things like that, right? And so, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, don't don't go through and say, oh, anything between a two and four is, is fine. That's just talking about if people are looking for benchmarks by which to gauge what's a large uh, studentized residual, some people say anything as low as two, some people say as high as four. I don't want you guys to be thinking about these things the same way we would think about uh, univariate outliers, right? So I uh, want to take a look and say, well, this is kind of problematic, but just looking at this doesn't give us a whole lot of information, right? What's better is if we start going down through and taking a look at some of our, some of our plots, right? So here, if I go down through and I take a look uh, this is my first, uh, well actually before we get there, let me go down through and take a look. All right, this is a gross residual plot, okay? I'm gonna go through, uh, you're gonna do a couple things to this residual plot. So I'm gonna uh, double click it, okay? And hey, this is sort of the same thing I was doing before. If I go down through and I go to uh, elements, I hit fit line at total and I request the lowest here, and then I hit apply, and then close out of this. This will give me my lowest fit line, and then if I go back to elements, and go back to the fit line of total, and now I'm gonna go through, and I'm gonna hit uh, mean of y. This is just gonna give me a line through my zero point, and then it's gonna put a label in there that I don't like, so I'm gonna click the tax label and then hit apply, and then close that out. Okay, then that gives me my sort of residual plot here. Now, what do I want out of a residual plot? So here, what I'm pro plotting here is my predicted values. And so this is my expected values of Y for the set. And then this is my 
C-minus residuals here, okay? And this is zero, okay? And so, because I'm running an ordinary least squares regression, what is the average, uh, what, is the, what is the mean of my residuals? It's zero, right? It's mathematically zero. Uh, the mean of your residuals will always be zero, okay? But what would I hope my residuals to look like uh, scattered around sort of over the course of my predicted variables? I want these to be a nice scatter of something like that, right? With sort of more, more of a higher values kind of sort of scattered around that. I want tight clustering around that zero line, and sort of nice reasonable distributions. I'm not seeing non-linearities here, right? I don't have weird stuff going on. I don't have uh, weird residuals where sort of most of my stuff is falling here. And my residuals here, that would look like I got skewed residuals, right? Because here's where most of my line is going, but when I miss, I miss low. Right, uh, this would look like uh, uh, skewed residuals, and if you go back through and take a look through your slides, uh, some of those different residual plots we're looking at, this is a wouldn't be a good thing. This, in a big set with a nice sort of good continuous variables, everything's looking good. This is kind of what I would want to, you know, this is kind of what I would want to see. All right, is that what we're seeing here? No, right. And so, and if my, you know, if I take a look at my lowest line, it's going from here down and then kicking up like this, right? And so I don't know what function that is, but it's, I'm nervous that it might, I might be nervous that it's not a straight line, right? Uh, but what's going on with, with this plot? What pattern are you seeing going on right now? Yeah. Clusters at the zero end right. and everything else. I mean, we're seeing diagonals, right? We're seeing sort of pretty straight lines, right? This is a complete function that our sort of outcome variable is garbage. It screwed up our, our, our residual plot, right? Uh, so we're seeing this is all the people who have, uh, I mean, th this is all the people who uh, had uh, scored zero on rule functioning or the, nat the natural log transform. These are people who had uh, 25, 50, 75, uh, 100, right? Um, what happens is because we haven't used an appropriate outcome variable, is it made our plot really hard to read. Um, so do we have problems with nonlinearity? Well, my lowest line is doing weird stuff, but if I'm looking at the average of this line across this, it's still kind of a, sort of centered around. I got some above, some below, and then some back above, so I don't know. I'd be super worried about that, right? Given the circumstances, it's not pretty, but whatever. Uh, and what about uh, uh, non-constant variance? Do I have concerns about homogeneity of variance here? Or excuse me, uh, heteroscedasticity? It's hard to tell, right? Um, because, I don't know, I, I mean, so my variance is zero here, and then it's big, and down here it's, I don't know, right? It's just really hard because I don't have an outcome variable that uh, I should have in a regression model, right? And so, um, probably, if we're looking at variability where we have variability. We don't have any variability from that part over because that's the variability is zero. If we look from here 
to there. It's kind of the same, sort of moving down, right? This is a really hard plot to interpret, again, because our outcome variable is garbage. Um, and so, I don't know that I would say I have strong evidence of heteroscedasticity here. Again, my biggest issue and my biggest concern with this is the fact that I've plugged in uh, an ordinal variable with five levels into my outcome. Okay. So, uh, generally semi-disappointed with sort of what that looks like, but this is the type of thing uh, that we're uh, trying to get at with this residual plot. This is what I want it to look like. And again, if you look through those slides, uh, when it's looking at sort of different types of heteroscedasticity, that's the plot that we should look like. And so going through and putting on the center line can kind of help you kind of see sort of where things are going on. But uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to note that I've got a weird plot and sort of identify why I've got a weird plot. But at the end of the day, I'm not saying I have obvious evidence of, uh, of nonlinearity going on, even though my lowest is doing a weird thing. I'm not going to say I have I don't have clear evidence of uh, problematic heteroscedasticity, and we'll just try and truck along the best we can with this. Sound all right? Okay. So then, uh, also want to take a look at our residuals uh, in terms of normal distribution. Okay. So here's my histogram of my normal distribution, and here's my PP plot. Okay. Uh, Evelina. What are you seeing in terms of this uh, in terms of this PP plot? Uh, yeah, all of the actual values fall close to the predicted values. What's that? The actual values fall close to the predicted variable values, so there's not a lot of discrepancy. Okay, not too much of a discrepancy here, right? Remember what we're looking at in this PP plot. If we had a variable, here we're talking about our, our residuals, but this could be any variable that we wanted to go through. If we had a variable that had a perfectly normal distribution in that my observed values are following exactly on my expected values based on an, uh, the assumption of a normal distribution, then my values would all kind of line up directly along this line, right? Here we have some deviations, but that's fine. They don't look too bad. Um, and the deviations that I'm seeing here are largely consistent with something that has uh, a distribution that has mild levels of kurtosis, right? Uh, something that starts to look kind of like this, kind of you get a little bit of an S thing. But if I go this through and I take a look at and I take a look at my uh, um, at my residuals, <coughs> uh, what's my <coughs> assessment of my residual plot here, Laura? Um, it looks a little like it's it's a little leptocurtic, yeah, a little bit. What, what else are you seeing in there, maybe? Uh, I mean, it falls like more or less within the shape, <coughs> except for those middle values. And, yeah. yeah. And then, like, there's a weird chunk at the end there. Weird chunk at the end, right? Yeah. And so this is one of the things. So having SPSS uh, superimpose a normal curve over the top of your uh, histogram is kind of, is kind of nice. Uh, one of the things, though, um, I haven't figured out how to get SPSS to do this. Uh, what we can also do, I mean, there's code you can do it, but it's not probably not worth the time and effort to go through and do it. But here, I'm um, sort of running these in this data, the data, what we call a kernel density uh, uh, curve onto this. And so basically, it's taking a look at sort of the actual sort of empirical distribution. And so if we take the same residuals and instead of superimposing that normal curve, we take a look at this kernel density plot. What we see is, so the population uh, distribution of this is sort of here, and that's kind of normal-ish. Then we've got kind of this lump here at the end. So we've got a, a small, looks like a level of small positive skew going on uh, with this a little bit uh, that we can see in uh, the SPSS output. It just sort of, the, um, so the normal distribution just kind of superimposes things. And if we wanted to, we could go through and we could go analyze uh, descriptives. I mean, you can say my studentized uh, residuals, and we could ketosis for that. I mean, if you wanted to actually get um, uh, 
values. I mean, so this is just sort of the indices for the uh, for the distribution I ran up here, right? So you see, sorry, slide. So again, I don't need you to go through and run skew and kurtosis values for your residuals. I just want you to go through, take a look, and see in general talk about what's going on. So here, I would say our uh, residual plot is kind of effed and hard to interpret because we've thrown a categorical variable, we've regressed a categorical variable onto something in our linear regression model, and linear regression models don't like that. But uh, it doesn't look like I have clear evidence of nonlinearity, uh, and I don't have clear evidence of non-constant variance across there. Uh, my residuals, uh, generally normal based on my histogram, my PP plot. Um, I've got uh, some uh, evidence of uh, potential uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's because you're saying pee pee. Pee pee. Yeah, it's a pee pee block. This <laughs> dirty little underground. But I don't make up the names. I don't make up the names. You know, we talk about normal probability plots. <laughs> We're nice. students, it's fine. <laughs> uh, nice work. Uh, I like it. Um, but overall, not, I mean, it's not, it is not anything, I mean, we can deal with it, right? So, uh, and saying, so want to go through and sort of note, note, note some skew here, some uh, violation, but it's, it's pretty good. But again, uh, why would we, uh, you know, Nick, if I'm looking at, uh, Possible skew in those residuals, positive skew. What, what's that probably a, a function of? Uh, so, in, in my residual plot here, I'm looking, it looks like I've got kind of a bump up here, uh, some positive skew to those residuals. What's, what can I, what can I uh, look at that to? What's that now? Probably because of your large temperature and see some people falling outside more relative to the. Okay, so and that and that would be the case if I if I was if I was going through. But if that was, uh, but I would also probably expect if it was just a large sample and I was just missing on some people, I probably miss some people low too. It looks like we don't tend to miss low; we tend to miss high. Uh, what what within this model probably accounts for sort of this this tendency to to miss systematically? So we got some skew in our residual. I mean, yeah. I thought I thought you lifted um, your finger to answer. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> What's what's the thing that's screwed us from the very oh. start? The role functioning, right? Because when I miss, I miss high because these are all the people who have high levels of functioning that my model doesn't do a great job. It overestimates, and so again, we're seeing some positive skew in my residuals, but it's because of that, because of uh, again. Uh, my outcome variable is kind of crappy, right? So if I'm saying everybody, we take a look at everybody with high levels of functioning, where are they occur, Where are they sort of lining up relative to my zero line? Almost always above, right? So what's going on here is again, I've got a skewed uh, distribution, or I've got a skewed outcome variable that's ordered categorical, and when everybody misses, so for all those cases that don't have zero, uh, aren't reporting zero role functioning, they're all, my my predicted value is higher than sort of, sort of what I would expect. Okay. All right. All right, uh, let's stop there, take a break. Um, and when we come back, we'll uh, finish up with uh, uh, identifying um, problematic cases or potential uh, questions on anything that we've done in terms of the screening up to this point. People kind of following along kind of where the where we're looking at and what types of things we're looking for and things. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, we've looked at the distribution of our residuals. What we're going to go down through and take a look at now is try and identify um, potentially problematic uh, cases, 
right? And here, remember, we're looking at uh, discrepancies, we're looking at leverages, and we're looking at uh, influence points. Uh, discrepancies, these are problems in our wide uh, space. Uh, these are cases where uh, we've got a large discrepancy between what we actually, actually observed and what we had expected based on our model. So discrepancies, we're going to look at our, resi uh, at our residuals here. Uh, that's going to be our uh, Y space. Uh, X space, our multivariate outliers, these are going to be things uh, that we're going to look at our influence points. These are going to be weird combinations of uh, variables for one reason or another uh, in our predictor space. And then influence is going to be a combination of discrepancy and leverage. Uh, influence uh, tells us to what extent does the inclusion exclusion of an individual case impact the overall model. Okay. So uh, remember that uh, in our regression model we had SPSS save our uh, studentized deleted residuals uh, which is our discrepancy measure, our leverages, which is our leverage measure, and then our cooks, uh, which is going to be our measure of influence. Okay. So if I go up and I'm, what I want to do is go through and I'll go, let's say, grab my, uh, so this descriptives command right here, and paste that in. And then take one of my examine commands and drop that in, right? And so what I'm going to look at first is SDR1, which is my studentized residual. If I go that should give me my studentized residual right here. Take that variable. What I've just done is I've sort of created syntax to say I want to give it, I want uh, SPSS to give me the descriptives for my studentized residuals uh, and then I want it to uh, give me plots for it. Now I could just run this all in examine if I wanted to because it's going to give you descriptives there as well, but this just in terms of presentation will be maybe easier for us to see. So I'm going to run those two and if I go through, take a look at my studentized residuals here. I see uh, minimum, maximum, right? And we had seen this before uh, in our regression and our diagnostic output that had already given us uh, uh, upper and lower values for this, uh, but just for the sort of didactic sort of go down through and see it. And again, not seeing anything that looks too bad, right? Particularly for a sample of this size. Again, if we're reading these as sort of on the same scale as we would uh, critical values for Z or T or things along those lines, this is not too bad, right? So we've got some stuff below. We've got some stuff above, uh, but not too terribly uh, uh, too bad here. If we go down through, we take a look at our uh, histogram. We actually already looked at this above because we had requested this in our model. This is just our uh, studentized residuals. Um, to oh, okay. So note that uh, your residuals here uh, that you got in your regression plot. These are just your uh, standardized residuals, okay? So these are just z-scores of your residuals versus this being your studentized residuals. So they're not going to be exactly the same, but in a sample of this size, they're going to be pretty close. Studentized residuals is what we're looking at in terms of our uh, of our discrepancy measure. Again. We're not too concerned about the distribution of these. We're more interested in looking at outlying values. Uh, we saw uh, our upper and lower limits are all within uh, under three, right? And so nothing that's looking at sort of problematic here in terms of outlying values. Uh, if I go down and I take a look at my box plot, we've got some values here falling above one and a half times the quartile range. Uh, but all in all, am I worried about any abnormally large uh, discrepancies here based on my studentized residuals? Well, it's looking pretty fine, right? So I don't have any discrepancy values that I'm too concerned about. Everything looks pretty reasonable here. Okay. People see what I'm looking at in terms of sort of looking for this. And so, again, so this is stuff going on in Y space. So let's go down through and take a look at our leverage values. I'm just going to go through and highlight sort of what I've done there and replace that in and then I'm just going to hit lev1 instead of str1 that's going to be my leverage values. So 
here, my leverage values. Now, my leverage values, remember, uh, uh, that SPSS, and SPSS, SPSS is calculating centered leverages. Lela, if you're running this in Stata, that's going to run regular leverages. These are centered leverages, uh, and so they're calculated a little bit differently. And so if we want to think about, okay, what are some recommended cut points for cases that might need further exploration, okay? For centered leverages, we're looking at two times the number of predictors over N, or people will say in small samples, three times the uh, number of predictors over N, right? I'm gonna say, let's focus on things that are three times, uh, and so for your centered leverages, average leverage value will be number of predictors divided by the, uh, uh, the number of people in your sample. That's gonna give you sort of the average. So this is gonna say three times the average, expected average of your centered uh, leverages. This is gonna give you a value of 0.045, okay? Now, I'm telling this to you as your benchmark. And so, so one of, and this is sort of side there actually, two times the average value is often cited as, hey, this is the threshold for something that you should take a look at. If you do that, you're gonna spend all day looking at leverages, because if we go through and we take a look at uh, your uh, maximum value here, you get a value of 0.056, right? And if we go down through and we take a look at our distributions, we see a skewed distribution, but that's fine. We don't, we're not worried about the distribution. What we're looking for are values that are high. And if we're saying my uh, cut point is 045, if I go to my leverages in my data set and I sort those, I guess it's not too bad. We have five values that are exceeding sort of my cut here. Okay. Um, if I were to go uh, two above, that would be a whole lot of stuff going on there, right? Um, but still, even five potential multivariate outliers starts to become a lot, right? Because remember with our multivariate outliers, not only do we have to say, hey, this is maybe a multivariate outlier, we have to follow up and say, why is it a multivariate outlier as well, right? And so if I go back and I take a look at my plot here, it looks like, how, how, many, how, many, how, many, how many points might I want to take more of a look at? I might say three, right? I mean, because if I pick this guy, then the question is, why don't I pick that guy? Because that guy's not that much different than this one, right? And then we got these ones, and it starts to become a never-ending issue where we're just going through and we're looking at stuff, probably at the end of the day to say, yeah, we're not gonna get rid of that person anyway, right? And so, what? this is where your graphical stuff starts to become important, is you wanna take a look at your, Lots of your leverages of your uh, influence points to say, all right, what's, what's a reasonable number of cases to go through and take a look? Because otherwise what we're gonna do is we're gonna get in there and we're gonna start fussing around with our data. And if we start kicking out people that are sort of just weird because we don't like them, it starts to change our model, right? We, probably, we got our thumb on the scale. Our model's gonna start fitting better and better because we're just throwing all the, out, all the cases that don't perfectly conform to what we would like. So here, I might say, it looks like uh, potentially case 310, 221, and 202 are maybe the cases that I might want to follow up and, and take a look at with stuff, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to my uh, syntax, and I'm just going to go compute, I'm going to say MB1, zero, put a period behind that, and you go exe period, that'll create a new variable called mv1, and then I just do that a couple more times. Call that mv2, call that 
call that MV3. squared my, or I've uh, sorted my leverage values here. If I go through and I take a look at my three biggest leverage values, right, they're 310, uh, 221, and 202, like I had seen in my graph, right, I decided that these are the, uh, these are the uh, cases that I'm going to go through take a uh, uh, better look at. So I'm going to just put a 1 in for multivariate 1, a 1 in here to mark multivariate 2, uh, one in there to mark multivariate three, right? Uh, these are going to be just dummy codes that are going to end up being my regressors. Just like we did uh, previously, uh, what we're going to try and do, what we want to do, we don't want to just say, it's not sufficient to say, oh, these are multivariate outliers based on high leverages values. Uh, what we want to do is want to go through and explore this a little bit and say, what's, what's going on in making these values kind of stick out? So if I do this, I go up to analyze, go to regression, linear, now instead of a uh, rule function, I'm going to make my outcome variable MV1. So now I've got opioid use PTSD severity uh, or pain uh, severity PTSD total as my predictors here. In terms of statistics, I don't need any of that. That's just going to muck up uh, everything. So I'm going to unselect all of that stuff. And plots, I don't need any plots. time, because I'm not interested in that. Save, I don't need to save anything off of this. Unselect all of that. Okay, and I'm going to paste that in. So I've got a new re regression model, kind of a bare bones regression model uh, that I'm going to go through and I'm going to take a look at for multivariate 1, and another one for multivariate 2, and then multivariate uh, So this is just poking around and taking a look to see what uh, what combination of variables is causing uh, this to, uh, uh, case to get flagged as dependent on multivariate outliers. So if I run my first regression, it's still, it's still giving me residual statistics and stuff like that. That's all right. What I want to do is just look at my coefficients here, right? And so if it looks like for my first, uh, for my first uh, case, so this is case 310. This is a case that had my largest leverage value. What it's looking like is I've got pain severity is kind of making this uh, uh, score stick out. And then maybe something going on with PTSD, right? So if I go through and I take a look at case 310, right? I see that my pain score is really low, 0.33, right? Uh, but if I then go through, take a look at my PTSD score, PTSD score is pretty high. So it looks like what I've got is I've got someone with a really low pain score combined with a really high PTSD score, which isn't impossible certainly, but it's it's causing some stuff to go. It's not typical of this sample, right? So we would just want to say, well, kind of a low combination of low pain, high PTSD is what's going through and giving this uh, and causing uh, the model to flag this as a as a high leverage value. Okay. Then, same thing if we go back through uh, to our second. So here we're just uh, regressing MB2 onto our outcomes. Same thing. Look at our coefficients. Here, it looks like we just got a PTSD score issue going on with this case, right? And so if we go through and we say, we know this is 221, I just got a really high PTSD score. That's what's causing this to be strange in terms of multivariate space predominantly. It's a high PTSD score, right? So I would record that. and then run my last one. What 
I'm seeing here, looking at the sign here, probably a low pain score, but nothing else is coming up as flagged. If I go through and take a look at 202, yeah, my pain score is zero, right? So that's what's kind of uh, causing these problems, right? So at the end of the day, I've got uh, one case that's marked by it looks like a low pain score and kind of a high PTSD score. We've got another one that's getting flagged for a high PTSD, another one that's getting low flagged for low pain, right? Um, now, if I'm just working off of benchmarks, I'm saying that these scores are all exceeding uh, my three times this, uh, the average value, uh, and that would be the cut point for uh, a small sample, but this is a large sample. These are multivariate outliers. I need to get rid of them. Does that seem reasonable here? No, right? Uh, so these are all scores, and again, these are pretty tame. I want to go through and just maybe go through and verify that this isn't, you know, wasn't supposed to be 11, instead of 111, so maybe go through and check that, right? Uh, make sure that maybe did this score actually, was this actually zero or is someone just not enter it, right? Want to make sure things are coming up, always checking the hard copies to make sure that there's not some entry error that's accounting for this. But at the end of the day, these all seem like reasonable people. Uh, who could be reasonable cases, right? And if I go up through and I take a look at my plots, and again, this is why best practice, like people who are doing good work in this area are saying, do not worry about the cut points. Cut points are, cut points are fine. They sort of give you something to at least sort of a reference point. Uh, but if I'm looking at my uh, leverage values here, I'm not some, seeing something that's here's my distribution, and then I got two cases that are way out here. That would be something more that okay, there's something odd going on that I need to go through and account for this. Here, these are cases that I might judiciously sort of note and say, but they all seem to be primarily driven by uh, high or low scores on a single variable. These are sort of as long as I verify that these scores are accurate based on entry. These are probably all people who are relevant parts of, of my distribution. And so probably just going to, at this point, I keep an eye on them and see if they don't come up somewhere else. Okay. How are people feeling about this? Because there's a lot of ambiguity in this, right? Like, it's nice if there's hard cut points. Anything like that, like a billionth of a decimal place above sort of this cut point, we actually throw it out. And, but, I mean, this starts to get more in the feel of you sort of understanding your model and sort of saying, is this problematic or not? People are going to see what we're doing here with, uh, with our... So this is, a, again, a weird combinations in X space, so these are like our multivariate outliers. So technically, we're using 3PN as our sort of cut point, then yeah, we've got like five, but if this is all we're getting in terms of uh, sort of the, our most extreme values, I'm actually not too worried about some of those other ones. Okay. But again, what I would be looking for is something that here's the distribution, and then I've got some joker hanging way the hell out there, right? That's the type of stuff I'm gonna be more interested in. Questions? Okay, so we go down through, take a look at that, and then the last thing uh, we would want to do is take a look at our Cook's values. Uh, this is our influence points. These are going to be combinations of uh, high discrepancy and high leverage. Um, this is going to be cases that, uh, because of their inclusion, um, they're having a big impact on the model. So I'm just going to take my same thing. And this to look at my cooks. So here, uh, for if I'm working on sort of recommended benchmarks for uh, my cooks D, saying let's go through and take a look at anything uh, for over n minus p minus 1, okay, and in this case, this is going to give us a value of 0 0.020. Okay, so once again, then we go through and take a look at my max value. Uh, 
my cut point is 0 0.02. Here I got 0 0.05, right? So I've clearly got sort of stuff that goes way above that. If I go down through and I sort by uh, Cook's leverage or my uh, Cook's D and go down through, if I'm flagging anything that uh, is above. I got a whole bunch of cases here that are going to require investigation if I'm simply just looking at uh, so that cut point, right? That's a lot of work, probably for a whole lot of nothing, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm once again going to rely more heavily on my uh, on my plots here. I'm going to go down through. I'm going to say, okay, I've got a handful of cases uh, that are registering as high leverage uh, values. Um, yeah, okay. I went through and I said, well, looking at my histogram, I've got a collection of probably five cases that are kind of set away from the rest of the distribution. And so these are cases that I might want to go through and just kind of flag and note uh, to say, hey, these are uh, uh, cases that have some combination of uh, uh, um, their residual values combined by their leverage is giving me something uh, strange going on here. And if I go through and I, so yeah, there's a one, two, three, four, five, six, five or six leverage values here, uh, what I might do is then go through looking like this is the break right there, right? So 358, so they got 0.41, uh, uh, 0 0.042, or 0 0.043, 0 0.043, 0 0.047, 0 0.045. Just might note those as, as high, as high Cook's D. Okay, you follow along, Evelina? Um, I don't think I saved the Cook's values. So oh, it's not okay. Like working to like go back and add them, so I'm just trying to figure Okay, so you just want to make sure that the that, uh, Cook's values are, are, that you request those to be saved. Okay. But this is where it starts to get, to get tricky, right? So I've, I've got a bunch of high leverage values. So my question is, well, so what? Like, are they bad enough to start to go through and impact uh, my regression model? Yeah, how do I determine sort of what do I do with this? So I've identified these as maybe ones that I might want to go through and, and talk about, but so well, then what do I do with that, right? So and this is the tricky thing with regression diagnostics. You can go through and chip away until you got like half of your sample gone if you're just going through and throwing things out. So again, one of those nice ways, uh, or one of the things you might do, and I would recommend you do, uh, to go through and sort of start to get a, an overall assessment of, so we've looked at uh, discrepancy, we've looked at leverages, we've looked at influence uh, points. How do, I, how do I make some sense of trying to figure out, so what, what, do, I, what do I do with these, right? Um, and once again, graphically, if we go through, and I go to graph, I go to chart builder, and I reset this, I ask for a scatter plot, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my leverages along my x axis and my studentized residuals on my y, okay? And I go through and I hit OK. This is going to go through and give me a plot that can be helpful for increase the size here. Give me a plot of it's going to give me a plot of my uh, leverage values and my residuals. So this is basically what I'm looking at here are cases that are going to be large uh, in terms of leverages. So these are uh, going to be cases that are odd on the x. So this scale is going to think about this uh, uh, x-axis as cases that are weird in x space, 
and this uh, Y value, uh, uh, this Y scale as being sort of my residual stuff. And so what I'm looking at with this is going to be stuff. I'm going to be looking for cases that have both high uh, leverages and high standardized uh, and higher low standard uh, studentized residuals. Okay. So I'm going to remember. So my studentized residual, I can have residuals in the positive direction or in the negative direction. And so what I'm going to be looking for is I'm going to be cases looking for cases that fall up here and cases that fall down there. Okay. Because those are going to be the cases that are potentially most problematic. They're going to be a combination of uh, high leverages and really low negative residuals or high leverages and really high uh, positive residuals. So stuff kind of going on sort of in those directions. Now one thing I can do with this, and it's not great because, and again, so this is where SPSS sort of falls a little bit, sort of, it's a harder to sort of go through and do things. But if I go and I uh, request the same graph, okay, let me make this bigger again. this up, make this bigger, and then if I go to, elements and I hit data label mode, So let's go elements and hit show data labels. What this is going to do is it's going to put a marker on uh, on your labels or on each one of these data points. Okay. Now the thing to remember, and I couldn't be able, to, I couldn't figure this out. Uh, I think the only way you can do this, and so these aren't your these aren't your subject numbers. This is the order like what where these values are in your data set okay um, so what this is saying is case that's at 201 well I know I have 201 people so this is the last case in the set is this one case down here that looks like it has kind of a largest negative residual and a highish leverage value here right so if I wanted to go through and go to my uh, data set, and I would look at, the, again, the variable that has, is in the case 201, it looks like this is case 130. And this is also the case that has the largest Cook's D, right? So we would recognize this as, you know, this case that's got some maybe, I don't know. I, and I don't even know that I would, sort of flag this too much, but you start to see how this is consistent. Uh, this case, uh, 130, is that right? 130 is also the case that had the highest uh, Cook's D, the highest influence value. And so what I might do if this was my model, probably wouldn't be too concerned about it. I mean, you would want something that again was pretty sort of tucked away with this. But what you could do is you could go through and run a model with this case and without this case and just look at the, at the difference. If I went through and did this, this case makes no difference. It has no impact on, uh, that's appreciable on anything. So I wouldn't get too worried about it. But uh, after you go through, so you're taking a look at your leverages, you're taking a look at your uh, discrepancy points, you've gone through and you take a look at your influence values, note the cases that are high, right? And then what you might say in terms of your screening is that uh, an investigator might consider uh, evaluating model results with and without these variables. But like this plot is a nice one to go through and run. 
because if you see folks like clearly hanging out in this quadrant or that quadrant, then that's going to be stuff that's problematic, right? Now, uh, again, uh, one of the nice things you'll see, uh, you know, these combination plots. Um, I haven't been able to try and I haven't figured out how to if I can make SPSS do this. Um, But this is a nice version of that plot within status. So this is the same thing that we plotted out here. We've got leverage values. Now these are SPSS are giving you center leverages, but these are sort of just leverage values. So the specific uh, scale might be a little bit different uh, by your standardized or your uh, studentized residuals. Um, So we've got the same plot, except uh, what we've asked uh, the program to do here is label the points by their subject number, right? And then the size of the circles around these uh, are uh, weighted in terms of the size of your Cook's D. So what you're looking at are cases with large circles, so indicating uh, large Cook's D, right? So things that are high influence points that are hanging out up in, that, in sort of these upper and lower quadrants and things along those lines. So again, we identified in SPSS that sort of this case, case 130, might be something that you might want to look and say, what's the impact on the model if I run the model with or without this case? Um, I could go back through and take a look and see uh, what exactly is going on in this case. So we've got someone who has lowish levels of pain but is taking opiates and has high PTSD and low role functioning, right? Now that in and of itself doesn't seem to be that odd, but uh, apparently within the context of this model, that's giving us sort of our largest uh, influence value here. It's giving me a, a large-ish negative residual and a pretty high leverage point. So. But again, we've got 200 something folks in here. It's probably not a huge issue. Uh, but uh, as you're going through and looking at the literature and thinking about things, uh, plots like this are a nice way to bring everything together. Because otherwise, you're going to have, oh, I got a handful of cases over here, and a handful of cases over here, and a handful of cases over here. What I do with those, or how I go through and address any of that stuff, starts to become problematic, or starts to become kind of hard to wrap your head around. If we can go through and plot everything kind of in the same. In, I don't think you can do this as in, uh, in SPSS, uh, but this plot here is functionally doing the same the same kind of thing. I just have to go back to and then find what the leverage value is for the case that's uh, in position 201 in there. Right? So then go through and do some follow up with that. Okay. So for your standard regression models. So this is important, always good stuff to do so you kind of know kind of what the nuances are or the, what types of characteristics are getting flagged in your model as being odd. Uh, but as we start to get into multiplicative models, interactive models, this is where this stuff starts to become really important because uh, as I uh, talked about before, we had uh, sort of a paper where we had three-way interaction and when you pull that three-way interaction apart, it wouldn't make any sense. Uh, but it was because we had a couple of cases out there that were driving the entire model that's what you don't want to have, because those are models that aren't replicable. Those are models that are going to give you funky results that then you interpret as, I found this new thing. No, you didn't. It's just a weird thing that's going on in your data. It's not an actual phenomenon. So this is the type of stuff you want to take a look at. Okay. Questions about any of this stuff? OK. Last thing, uh, so we've gone through and identified uh, sort of like potential cases that are kind of maybe weird. Um, last thing you could do, and you, you rerun your model again if you wanted to, or you don't have to because you've already got the analyses. Um, if I go to correlate bivariate, I want to look at pain and severity. <coughs> Excuse me, opioid use, PTSD, and then a the natural log my role functioning variable. Take a look at my uh, at my um, 
intercorrelations, right, to just see if I have multicollinearity stuff going on, right? Um, now, my role functioning variable has a pretty strong correlation with my pain score. The modest correlation with LPE use, but so I'm not concerned about necessarily with the correlations with my outcome, right? Now, if you've got something that's super highly correlated, then you're concerned. I mean, you may have concern that your predictor and your outcome variable are the same thing, so you definitely want to look at that. But in terms of multicollinearity, want to look at correlations among your uh, predictors. Here we see pain severity and opiate use is correlated to 0.344, right? So, but that's well within the bounds. We're not worried about that, right? And then if we go back up to our original, we could rerun the model or we could just run back up to our uh, regression model where we got all our diagnostics, right? Uh, and we can go through and take a look at our, uh, at our DIFs. And the IFs here are looking all good, right? Um, again, variance inflation factor, we're looking at scores greater than 10 is problematic. And if you get anywhere close to 10, you have a problem a long time ago. Uh, but variance inflation factors here are all highest one is 1.15 that we don't have. We guess this from our bivariate correlations, but uh, again, the IF is going to tell you whether or not you have uh, redundancies within multivariate space that's looking all pretty good. So all in all, I think we're doing all right in terms of our uh, multicollinearity stuff. So if we go through and do that on the back here, uh, we've got uh, uh, what I might go through and take out of this that we walk through in terms of a write-up, uh, looking at accuracy, plausibility, missing values, univariate distribution. So I'll go through my talk about that. Uh, univariate outliers, bivariate associations, residual stuff, discrepancies, influence, uh, sort of leverages, kind of what we're doing there. Um, uh, what the only thing I might add to this that I that uh, we've done here is I would probably go through and add. description of your uh, leverages by residual plot just to say you know sort of in overall recommendations talking about hey it looks like we got one point right there that should also uh, leverages by residual plot uh, identifies one case that sort of might be worth looking into identify the case say that case always is also associated with the large uh, leverage value the largest leverage value in the set uh, might recommend that people go through and run the model with and without just to make sure that that's not having too big of an issue, uh, but then kind of tying this all together. And so here, um, for the most part, this was all looking pretty good. Our biggest issue is the fact that we've got a categorical variable as our outcome in a model that's supposed to be used for continuous variables. That's the biggest thing that's causing it. The weird stuff that we found throughout all of this screening was a direct function of not having a good outcome variable. And so just seeing that how it starts to make uh, uh, a, a, an impact in terms of selection of model variables and sort of levels of measurement, and making sure that I've done a good job of planning out what I'm going to do and sort of mapping that on my model. Uh, we're going to go through and use this uh, to go through and look at some multiplicative effects too. Uh, we're going to ignore all the warts that we found on this, pretend that they're not there for the purposes of didactics. But if this was my paper and I was something I wanted to do, I would say we need to have an, an ordinal regression model that's going to go through and account for the fact that uh, we really don't have a continuous outcome variable, even though it's sort of zero. Yeah. So the, the fruits of my spring break, trying to pull all this stuff together so I <laughs> can thank me later. Um, Question, but it, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of information, a lot of stuff to fit and piece together. Questions about sort of global approach for goals, what we're trying to do with this stuff. Yes? So, in terms of like group versus ungroup data, mm -hmm. when we're utilizing the, um, regression, is there a possibility of it being grouped? No. We can use grouping data. Remember, anything that we can do in, a, in an ANOVA model, we can. Uh, with the proper coding, we can run a regression. So it's possible, and we'll get into this, uh, where maybe I have uh, a categorical variable where I have uh, three three different groups or something like that, right? Um, 
really all of uh, your um, uh, experimental designs you can run. Experimental designs are just a special case of regression, right? So let's say that I have uh, three different conditions, right? Condition zero or one, two, and three, uh, but then a bunch of continuous covariates and stuff like that. I can run that in a regression model, get the same thing I would get in an ANCOVA model, uh, just with proper coding. You just have to make sure uh, that uh, there's a lot of different coding strategies that you can use. You just want to make sure that you've uh, chosen a, a coding strategy where what ended up doing, you're taking that uh, uh, multi uh, categorical variable and reducing it into a, like a series of numbers or something like that. And how you would go about through it, how you would do that would depend on what specific hypotheses you have. Other questions? Okay, cool. This is tricky. So as you're walking through and, and sort of working on uh, regression stuff, uh, if you have questions, touch base with Angeline, come touch base with me. Because a lot of this, probably if I had to guess, your angst is largely the fact that, well, this is thing, like who the hell knows if he wants me to talk about this or not. If you have that question, come talk to me, say, hey, this is what I found. Should I go through and talk about this a little bit more? And I'll be like, yeah, if you can or don't worry about it. Because again, what I don't want you guys to do is be like, oh, I found, 15 different cases that were above my threshold and leverage, and now I have to go through and run a uh, regression to talk about what each, rely on your uh, graphical methods to identify cases that sort of maybe warrant follow-up. Uh, and if you come in, you beg, hey, this is kind of what I'm thinking about. It might seem to be cool to me, okay? Cool. All right. So what we're going to do here, we'll finish up uh, with uh, working through our regression stuff. So we talked about um, after we've gone through and done all this stuff, right, then we actually get down to regressing things on other things. It'll take us all two seconds. Uh, if you've got a model like this that you didn't, at the end of the day, we're not going to throw any cases out or we're not going to change anything. You've already ran your regression. Just go back through and take a look at the coefficients on it, right? Um, uh, but with a standard multiple regression, remember here what we're doing is we're taking um, all of our variables and, and or all of our predictors and looking at these simultaneously within the context of a model, right? Uh, and so, big questions that we're asking with our simultaneous multiple regression, uh, looking at uh, to what extent. Uh, is are this combination of predictors accounting for variability in my outcome? Uh, what's our what's our test statistic that's answering that question? What is it? Go for it. My R squared value, right? So, what is is this collection of predictors doing a good job of accounting for variability? And a good, good job is sort of a subjective thing, but sort of to what extent? is the combination of these predictors associated with some uh, variability in my outcome. And then also taking a look at a unique relation of my individual predictors with my outcome, controlling for everything else in the model. This is a test where we're going to go through and look at our individual uh, regression coefficients, right? Talk about a long transform, log transform, the natural log transform. Uh, and so wanting to make sure that we're sort of taking some of this stuff into account. If you do natural log transform, I do want you to sort of incorporate these uh, 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 conceptual uh, interpretations in. Um, it's just it's just a good way to start sort of getting into the practice. If I have a good viable conceptual interpretation of this, go ahead and use it. You know, otherwise it's just you're leaving cash on the table there. Okay. Different uh, approach is going to be our hierarchical regression model. Uh, different in that we set up the model uh, a little bit differently but not different in that it's exactly the F and same as everything that we would do in, a, in a, just a standard regression model. I get really worked up, like people who think hierarchical models are special or different or that something else is or something new and unique is going on, they're not. We're just layering in stuff. Um, what we get with a hierarchical or, or sequential regression is we're layering in predictor set of predictors uh, in different stages determined by you, the experimenter, right? A um, couple different things that we can go about looking at our hierarchical models. Uh, and we can talk about this as a, as a step up or a step down approach. Uh, 
one uh, way to go about and do this is uh, people will take, uh, let's say I've got a model, I'm trying to predict an outcome, and I've got sort of three variables that I'm really interested in, and then I've got maybe uh, two or three kind of control variables, right? One way to approach this would be to go through and take my three variables of interest, put those in the first block, and then go through and add those other two controls into the second block. And what we're wanting to do is take a look and see, all right, in the first block, do my, are, do my predictors hold, my predictors, is a, predict, predictors of interest hold a unique relation with my outcome, right? And I say, yep, looks like all three of them hold a statistically reliable association uh, with my outcome controlling for each other, so all of them are, are reliable. And then what I would do is I go through in a later block is layer in my control variables. And the question is, do my predictors of interest, do my variables of interest, do they continue to hold a unique relation with my outcome even once I'm controlling for these control variables? And oftentimes we're thinking about these are nuisance variables, right? Uh, these are sort of things that, uh, you know, I've gone through, let's say, uh, I mean, it was run an experimental design, and so sort of I've got my uh, sort of condition and I've got some other sort of individual difference thing, but then I sort of, I would just want to make sure that it's not attributable to gender or GPA or some other thing. I don't care about these. These aren't important things for my model. I just want to make sure that uh, sort of my predictors of interest are still holding relations with my outcome, even once I control for the, sort of this nuisance variable stuff, okay? Other approach, uh, kind of a step up approach uh, here, we're just kind of doing the reverse. We take all my nuisance variables, all my control variables, throw those in the first block. Say, all right, so this is sort of just, I'm accounting for just background stuff like that. Go through, take a look at that, and then in a later block, so I got in my first block, I got my first couple variables that I just wanted sort of control for, and then in my second block, I go through and put in my next three that are gonna be stuff that's important that I kind of want to go through and take a look at, right? And so, um, this is a stylistic difference. It makes no difference which one, like it does not matter, right? It makes no difference. The only thing that, that you get different between your hierarchical regression and your standard multiple regression is a calculation of your R-squared R change. Nothing else is different with these models. There's nothing magical that happens if you run it, in fact, well you should run this as a hierarchical model. I could. Right. What, do you, what do you think is going to happen that's different, right? Because what's going to happen is you're in your first block, and so the way uh, uh, these models run is you go through, and you're basically running a series of separate regression models. Your first regression model, you're regressing uh, your uh, outcome onto, say, your control variables. You're going to get an R squared, you're going to get an F value that's going to tell you, so it's basically giving you a simultaneous regression model for the first one, right? And then in the next step, you throw in your other three variables that you're interested in. All SPSS is going to do is now it's going to run a second regression model that has all five regression uh, or all five predictors in it, and it's just going to give you uh, an R squared value for that model and an F for that model. And it's going to give you all the individual uh, coefficients for that model, and then it's just going to tell you how much uh, your model R squared changed from the first step to the second step. So with the entry of these additional variables, how much additional variability in our outcome are we talking about? How much, uh, so what's the point estimate for that change in R-squared? Is that R-squared change uh, reliably different than zero? That's the end of it, right? So if you have a research question that it makes some sense, and let's say that I'm interested in the, uh, Haley's got a study where she's interested in looking at jury, uh, juror perception of guilt, right? and you've gone through and taken a look at a meta, taken a, looked at a meta-analysis, and you say um, these four variables are things that people have really looked at, um, and this looks like these are things consistently across the literature that hold a relation with or perceptions of guilt. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a study. I'm going to measure those four things, but then I've got two other variables that I think are important, right? And I'm thinking that these variables are going to predict above and beyond sort of this other stuff because they're kind of getting at a different aspect of perceptions of guilt that really aren't captured in these, right? And so maybe what you do is in the first block you throw in 
to the sort of racial, ethnic background, gender, something like that, right? And so then you've got your first block, and your model is going to tell you how well the, those combination of variables predict the perceptions of guilt. And then the second block, you're going to go through and you're going to layer in these four variables that meta analyses say predicting outcome, right? And that uh, then you're going to have how many variables? You had two in the first step and four in the second step. In the second step, how many total variables are you going to have? How many total predictors are you going to have? Six. Six, right? How well do these six predictors go through and predict your outcome, right? You're going to get an R squared change, which is going to tell you uh, how much additional variability the inclusion of these four additional predictors are going through. Now, individual coefficients are the same coefficients that you would get if you were just ran the full six in the model anyway, right? But that, the only thing we're getting there is that R squared change. And so you could say uh, that the inclusion of these additional predictors that have been found to be associated with perceptions of guilt are adding 20% uh, uh, more variability in my outcome above and beyond like the 3% that were calculated by sort of back stuff, right? And then what you do in the third step is to say these are my pet pro or this is my these are my pet variables. These are the things that I think are really important. And then what you do in the third step, add those two variables in. And so now you've got eight variables in your model. And what you're going to get is an R squared for the eight variables. And then a uh, R squared change that shows you how much additional variability in my outcome is being added once we layer in uh, these two additional variables. And hopefully what you would hope is you would say uh, that this is adding an additional 5% of the variability in my outcome. It's statistically reliable. So basically these, the combination of these two variables are adding an additional 5% of the total variability above and beyond this other stuff that's been uh, accounted for and controlling for other things, right? But in that last block of the model where you've got all eight of those variables in there, those coefficients are going to be identical as if you were to just done all, jumped all eight of them in. That last model is not going to be any different than if you just ran a simultaneous regression model with all eight of them in there anyway, right? The only thing we're getting is being able to tell a story about the added incremental uh, addition of uh, variability accounted for with each one of these things as we step through. But in terms of individual coefficients, by the time you get to the bottom, right, uh, whether or not things have a unique relation uh, with your outcome has no impact on how they were entered because it's just a series of sequential aggressions, right? So this is, and what I think happens is sometimes people get hierarchical regression confused uh, with stepwise regression, which is a different thing we'll talk about it. You should never use it. Um, but uh, for a hierarchical uh, linear regression or sequential regression, we're just saying, I want you to structure this regression so that we've got these variables in the first block, then add these other ones in the second block, and then add these other ones in the third block. And the only thing that's changing in terms of the coefficients, the estimation, anything like that, is just SPSS is giving you a measure of R squared change in testing. All right, so if we go through and we take a look, uh, so here let's say uh, in our standard regression, what we're going to do is we're going to regress uh, PTSD on the, or excuse me, we're going to regress role functioning on the opiate use, pain, and PTSD. Um, and then in our hierarchical regression, we're just going to layer these in. First, we're going to, the first block, we're just going to include opiate use. The second block, we're going to include pain. The third block, we're going to request PTSD. And then in statistics, we're just going to ask for R squared change and part partial correlations with this. Okay, so for my hierarchical uh, regression, my question might be, what's the incremental contribution of pain severity to, to the prediction of functional outcome above and beyond uh, medication use? Right. What's the incremental contribution of PTSD symptoms to the prediction of functional outcome above and beyond medication use and overall pain? We're just kind of layering stuff in on top of this. Right. Now here, just because we're we only had three predictors in my in my example, but uh, you can add in sort of blocks of predictors, right? So, uh, if I'm taking a look at my output in terms of what SPSS gives me, um, and we're looking at our R squared, it's sort of our model summary stuff at the top of the page, right? And so you've also got a handout here, uh, standard and hierarchical regression models. So you've got this stuff now. Note that your uh, um, coefficients are going to be a little bit different because I forgot to log transform pain in the in the slides, and so note that so this is the regression, the log transform of or excuse me, the log transform of role function on outcome. This is just regular stuff. So 
if you're noticing deviation, that's what it's about, but the concept will be the same here, okay? So here, uh, this is our standard regression where we've regressed uh, role functioning, or excuse me, role functioning on a PTSD, opioid use, and uh, pain, and here's my hierarchical model where I put pain, in, uh, opioid use in the first block, pain in the second block, uh, PTSD in the third block, okay? Um, Layla, what are we seeing? So this R squared, so this is my R squared for my simultaneous regression. Uh, what, what, what similarities are you seeing here with your R squared versus sort of what we got down there at the bottom? Um, in your third model, um, it's yeah. right. So basically what my hierarchical model has done, model one, or my first step is just regressing uh, pain or excuse me, opioid use on my outcome. Second step is regressing opioid use and pain on my outcome. Third step is regressing opioid use, pain, and PTSD on my outcome, right? And so I can go through and I can say, uh, by the time I get to my third step, I've just run my full regression up here. There's nothing different that's going on, right? Uh, but if I wanted to go through and take a look, I could say, well, uh, opiate use is accounting for about 5% uh, of the, uh, the variability in role functioning, right? And my R squared change is 0.05 because I didn't change from zero, I guess. Right? So you wouldn't want to take a look, sort of care too much about your F squared change, things along those lines for that first one. But if we go down through to take a look at the second model, where we've now regressed opiate use and pain onto, or excuse me, role functioning on opiate use and pain, uh, now all of a sudden our R squared went from 0.05 to point. Three, five, right? So we're accounting for a combination of opiate use and pain is accounting for about 35% of the variability in my role functioning outcome. And if I go through and I take a look at my R squared change value, that's about a 30% increase in the variability above and beyond just opiate use of it by itself. And that 30% increase is associated with a statistically significant effect. It's, it's, uh, uh, pain is in, uh, uh, added non-zero variance to the, uh, uh, to the calculation of my outcome. And then if I throw PTSD here in on the out, uh, on the, at the bottom, so now I've got, uh, and if you see here, A, B, and C, this is telling me what predictors are in these models. All three of my predictors are now accounting for 37.6% of the variability in my outcome. Uh, that's about a 3% increase, right? So PTSD by itself is accounting for another 3% uh, of the variability in my outcome. That's also a significant R squared change value. Here's my P value. So you can see, uh, by the time I get here, it's the same thing as my standardized, uh, as my uh, uh, simultaneous model. It's just sort of layering things in, sort of telling me what this set of predictors adds above and beyond the stuff in the last step, which can be sort of an interesting thing to go through if you're running a, a if your question is kind of structured in this way. But oftentimes we're not interested necessarily in. Uh, predicting proportion of variability where it enters in individual predictors and so it's good if we want to take a look at it this way but also nothing magical going on here. Okay. Questions about what's happening within sort of these, each, one of the, each one of these steps? Yeah. So we can kind of partial each of the variables. We don't have to think of them as like the combination of opioid and pain accounts for 34%. We can think of it as um, like pain accounts for about 29%, since we know that opioid accounts are about 5%. We can, and so this is typically not the way you would set up and put together. So typically we're, uh, we're in our blocks of uh, blocks of variables, okay. right? So you would say, so if I ran this as two, right? If I wanted to look at uh, whether or not pain and PTSD, how much in the first step, and then pain and PTSD in the second, and then I would say the combination of pain and PTSD are accounting for whatever my R squared change was greater than sort of this before, right? Here we've layered things in individually, just to kind of see in this the example we've got. But then what you would want to do is you would say the combination of pain and PTSD, if you want to take a look at individual predictors, there's other stuff we can do we'll through that. Okay. Okay. John, did you have a question? Uh, so do we want to pay attention to this significant change at all? Do we want to pay attention to the significant change? That's an excellent question, right? So this is what happens. Sometimes, we'll talk about this in terms of how we go through and uh, approach uh, moderation. Sometimes people will say, well, what you need to do is you need to run your moderation analysis in a hierarchical 
progression where you have your uh, first order effects enter the first block and you may have to layer in your uh, interactions in the second block. And if you have a three-way interaction, interact that in the third block because what you want to uh, because you want to see whether or not those interaction terms uh, improve the overall fit of the model relative to your fixed predictors. You can do that if you wanted to, but uh, I, uh, as a psychologist, am not often interested in sort of maximizing my prediction of my outcome. I can care less about what my R squared value is most of the times. I shouldn't. I should care more because the higher it is, the more powerful my model is. But if this is the model I'm running, I really don't care whether or not my interaction term contributes to uh, my overall R squared because that's not the point of what I'm doing. My point is to test the theoretical prediction uh, that these this uh, third variable moderates the relation between my predictor and my outcome, right? And so, if those uh, if those interaction terms add to the overall R squared, cool. If they don't, but that interaction term is still statistically significant, I'm going to interpret it anyway, right? So it's just a lot of, sort of jumping through hoops to do something that no one cares about anyway, right? Um, and so. I don't run my regression analyses that way. I just, so if I'm running a moderation analysis, I just run the moderation, moderation analyses and don't worry about screwing around with uh, uh, step or hierarchical models. But some people sort of are very ingrained because they've been told that this is the way that you have to do it. So then it puts me in a position where I'm like, it didn't increase, it's sort of marginal, but that's not the point of what I'm doing. So this is a hassle for you to have to go through and talk about it anyway. So. Um, but again, what ends up happening is people think there's something uh, magical going on in the context of the hierarchical stuff, which there's not. So. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's like that, Yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah, exactly. It's just like is 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 the sort of does the addition of this uh, block of predictors uh, sort of give you some? Uh, does it add non-zero variability? Is it adding something? Is it adding something uh, to the overall prediction of your outcome? Which, in some cases, could be an important question, right? Uh, if I add these things in, in Haley's case, uh, if the combination of her pet predictors add, if her R squared change doesn't is not statistically significant when you throw those in, ooh, particularly if it's something practical like your sort of perceptions of guilt, it's going to make it hard for you to make a strong argument that, hey, yeah, well, this is an important thing to be looking at if it didn't go through an ad, right? Um, but that's kind of a different question than sort of a lot of things we go through and ask. And so your significance test of your R squared change is just asking, is is that R squared change value statistically reliably different than zero, right? So even if it is uh, statistically significant, if I got enough people in there, yeah, it might have added something that's not zero, but it's not anything worth getting worked up about or interesting anyway, right? Uh, and so recognizing all the things that start to influence our statistical tests and things along those lines. Other questions? All right. So uh, same thing. So this is our R squared table, right? So this is just our R squared value for all three predictors. Here we're going with one predictor, two predictor, three predictors, just kind of lining it all up. Uh, our ANOVA table, right? Again, this is my standard regression. So I'm saying combination of three predictors. This is an F test of my R squared value. My R squared is statistically significant, suggests my R squared value is reliably different than zero, right? Saying that the uh, best linear combination of these predictors is accounting for some non zero amount of variability in the model. How much non zero variability? Let's go back up, take a look at your R squared, sort of tying all that stuff together in your hierarchical model. Again, it's just take, you just essentially run three different regression models, right? Uh, you run a regression model with just opiate as a predictor, a regression model with opiate use and pain severity as a predictor, and a model with opiate use, pain severity, PTSD as a predictor. Uh, you're getting an, R, uh, an F test for your R squared value for each one of those, right? Uh, and again, uh, you'll take a look at your uh, the residual sums of squares and things along these lines. You know, the total variability is the same in each one of these. Why is that? Why is my total variability uh, identical across all three models? Yeah, I'm using the same piece of pie. This is just variability in the uh, 
uh, my total variability is just all the variability in my outcome variable, right? And I'm using the same outcome variable, so this all stays the same. But what we start seeing is my sum of scores regression, my ability to predict my outcome above and beyond just guessing the mean starts to get incrementally larger with each one of these. Sum of scores residual, this is how much uh, of, a, uh, of a difference, and so you can see this is going down because I'm getting better at predicting more stuff, right? So this is just individuals, so we've got just three different ANOVA tables. We've taken this, we've just replicated it for one predictor, two predictors, all three predictors. Okay. And then our coefficients, right? Uh, again, uh, in my um, full outcome uh, here, right? I've got uh, my prediction of opiate use, pain severity, and PTSD total, right? Uh, and in this model, with all three of my variables together, uh, what are my two uh, reliable predictors here? What is it, Nick? Pain and PTSD, right? And so pain uh, is looking at, if I'm sort of interpreting this uh, model, or my regression coefficients here, within the context of my simultaneous model, remembering that I, in this example, I have a log transform role functioning, uh, but I'm saying that a uh, unit increase in pain is expected to result in a 0 .685 uh, uh, point reduction in uh, role functioning, uh, controlling for opiate use and PTSD total. Here I'm saying uh, a unit increase in PTSD total score associated with a 0 .01 uh, unit decrease in role functioning, holding my other variables, uh, uh, constant at zero. Opiate use. Uh, what's that? Yeah, it wouldn't be percentage. Uh, this for for this model, it's not. Uh, I didn't log transform. Oh, I did log transform. Jesus, what am I doing? Okay. Yeah, I guess I. I, I need to go through figure out whether a log transform or not. But yes, absolutely. With a log transform here, right, uh, we would say uh, for uh, this coefficient here, uh, because we've log transformed our outcome, we're saying a one unit increase in pain associated with a 69% decrease in role functioning, right? Here, uh, PTSD, uh, one unit uh, increase in PTSD associated with a 1% uh, decrease in role functioning. Uh, given that we've got a natural uh, log of our role functioning variable here, right? And this seems really small, but if we go through and we take a look at our standardized coefficients, right? Remember that this is a standard deviation unit increase in this, uh, corresponding to standard deviation increase, decrease in our outcome. Here, I wouldn't, don't try and put percentages on this, right? We would just say uh, that it looks, uh, based on this, we would say a standard deviation increase in pain severity is associated with uh, a little over a half a standard deviation decrease in the natural log transform of role functioning. I need to sort of say that appropriately. Uh, PTSD looks like it's holding a, little, uh, a weaker association in the horse race. It's not as contributing as much to the pie, but we're saying that a standard deviation unit uh, increase in uh, PTSD symptoms severity associated with a 0.16 standard deviation unit decrease in the natural log transform of role functioning, right? Um, and then here, opiate use, we didn't uh, do anything with that. That's just coded zero, no, one, yes. And it's not statistically significant, so I wouldn't waste a bunch of time putting a, a, a practical interpretation on something that's not even in the vicinity of statistically significant. Uh, but uh, if this was reliable, right, uh, what it would say is that sort of uh, opiate use is associated with a 0.04 unit decrease in role functioning, right? So we're just going from zero to one, right? So this is literally the difference uh, between and the average difference in role functioning across people with uh, not taking opiates and people who are taking opiates after we control for these other things in the model, okay? Now what's interesting, if we go through and take a look, so opiate use has no unique relation with my outcome, right? What was my, what was my uh, R squared value when opiate's the only thing in the model? It's 0.05, right? And if I look at my F value, 
that's statistically significant, right? So opiate use was a significant predictor in that first step of the model. By the time we get to step three, uh, it's not predicting anything, right? What happened there? What do you think, Kate? Once you add in those other two, they just, yeah. whatever you saw there was accounted for by those two other variants. Yeah. And so whatever uh, variance uh, that uh, opiate use shared with my role functioning outcome is also being, is also shared with uh, pain, probably. Pain severity is probably what I would guess, right? And so once I uh, throw pain, uh, 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 pain severity into the mix, uh, opiate use doesn't do anything, right? Now I can see that here, because if I go through and I take a look at the second block of this model, uh, if I look at block one, opiate use has a statistically reliable association with my outcome, but here in block two, once I add pain severity into the mix, that's now opi or pain severity score into the mix, opiate use goes to sort of very clearly not, right? So any shared variability is also combined with shared variability with, uh, with pain severity, and so pain severity still has stuff above and beyond opiate use that's bringing the party, but opiate use is no longer a significant does that mean we don't need opiate use in the model? No, why not? Okay. Because it's still, like, when you have it in there without everything else, there's still something there, but it yeah. needs to come for something, even yeah. if it's not. I would say if I was looking at sort of the prediction of role functioning and people with motor vehicle accidents and survivors with chronic pain, opiate use might not be a reliable predictor, but conceptually, the extent to which people are using medications is probably an appropriate thing to have in there to some extent. And we'll start to see in the, when we get into the moderation stuff how these variables can start to impact things even though we might not see a main effect here. So again, this has to do go back to uh, questions about model specification. Uh, correctly specified model says everything that needs to be in there and relevant stuff that's in there is in there. Stuff that doesn't need to be in there is in out. So theoretically, I would say this is an important variable to have in there even if it's not statistically significant. And this is where people start to get into some troubles back, well, I'm just gonna start kicking out any of my predictors that aren't statistically reliable. You're trying to specify your model then, right? Because if you've added it in there, it should be in there for a reason. If it's in there for a reason, you just go ahead and keep it in there, okay? So um, here, again, if we take a look at our coefficients here, identical to the coefficients down here, this is just coefficient for a re simultaneous regression ran with one predictor, Simultaneous regression ran with two predictors, and then we get three here, right? So again, um, with our hierarchical models, these can be useful tools, but mostly for a presentation thing. And if our questions are about how much, uh, what's the incremental variance uh, variability in the prediction of my outcome uh, increased by the inclusion of this predictor, set of predictors, hierarchical models are great. Um, but if that's not your question, if you're not interested in incremental proportion of variability that's uh, added with the addition of other models. You can do it if you want to, but it's not necessary. Questions? All right. Um, yeah, we call it good there. You guys have enough uh, to go through. Uh, we'll just touch base on these last couple. Stepwise is bad. No, don't do it. It's not a good